people on the on the phone. But I'll just confirm that. Right. Okay. Your Worship? Yes. Uh, they are having microphone issues in the room next door to me, but they let, they've let me know that we're live now and you're good to start. Okay. All right. So with that, uh, we will get started then. Oh, just a second. Um, uh, uh, Councillor Harris has requested, and the meeting link was emailed out earlier this afternoon. It should have been in the same email you received. Just waiting for Councillor Harris to come on. Mr. Fleming, is there anyone that can reach out to uh, Councillor Harris? To... Uh, yeah, Your Worship, I'll, uh, I'll try and give him a call here. That's okay. So, Ledge Services, if you can just put the, uh, res uh, the break on for a second while we're waiting, and then let me know when we have everybody. He says it's not working. So, Ms. Moulter, if you can just have Ledge Services put up a recess for a couple of minutes, we'll all go offline until we can see him come on, please. Thank yes, you. we'll do.
Okay, Ms. Moulter, um, Councilor Harris is gonna continue to try and work on it, but uh, he said, go ahead and he will, as soon as he integrates, he will integrate. So if everybody wants to come back online, we will uh, begin our live streaming. Okay, thank you very much. So welcome uh, everybody. We will resume our uh, June 23rd, 2020 regular council meeting. And uh, with that, the first item that we have will be the approval of the June 9th, 2020 uh, uh, meeting minutes that were held virtually. Uh, Councillor uh, Abatoye, that would be your motion. I will make a motion that council approves the June 9th council meeting as printed and presented. Thank you. Are there any errors or omissions? Not seeing any, I will close the motion. Please cast your vote on the approval of the June 9th, 2020 uh, minutes. Uh, Deanna, if yours isn't working, or Councillor Lennox, I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, it's not working. I, I, I'll vote in favor, please. Okay, Councillor, okay, so to uh, Jennifer, Councillor Lennox has voted in favor. Councillor Harris is still not on yet, so he will not be recording a vote. So you can go ahead, Councillor uh, Jennifer. Thank you. So that is carried. Thank you very much. The uh, next item that we have uh, is delegations. We have uh, had nobody pre-register to have a delegation. So we will move on to the Metropolitan Region Servicing Plan. And uh, we have um, Sharon Shuya and Karen Wichuk uh, with us presenting. We have about 30 minutes for the uh, Regional Servicing Plan. And Mayor Ralph is on here as well. So uh, welcome to the three of you. We have about 30 minutes. So I will let, I, I anticipate it's uh, Ms. Shuya that's uh, doing the presentation. You may go ahead. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, with uh, CEO uh, Wichick to make some opening remarks followed by um, Chair Ralph and then myself. I will do the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Ketcher. Okay, thank you. Can you unmute? How's that? Is that better? That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Catcher, and thank you, Council. My job today is actually the easy job. Um, but before I, I introduce Mayor Ralph, I did want to acknowledge the work of Councillor Harris on the task force. His comments and contributions were insightful and valuable and were uh, a large part of ensuring that um, we landed with the inaugural MRSP that we do have today. So uh, with that acknowledgement, I'll move on to let you know that I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Mayor Ray Ralph from the town of Devon today. Uh, Mayor Ralph served as chair of the task force for the uh, MRSP. He showed true regional leadership throughout his time as chair and focused on ensuring that a regional perspective was advanced at the table. Mayor Ralph's dedication is evidenced today and over the last several months, uh, while the formal work of the task force is complete, Mayor Ralph has committed to attending 12 of the 13 presentations to member municipalities. And in fact, I believe today is presentation number 11. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Mayor Ralph and I'll be here to help answer any questions at the end. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wood Woodchuck. And uh, welcome Sharon, or Mayor Ralph, sorry. You'll have to unmute Mayor Ralph. How's that? 
That's you, good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's funny how it looks like uh, my it is unmute, but it is muted still. So I apologize for that. Um, thank you, Karen, for that kind introduction. Um, on behalf of the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board, and as chair of the Edmonton, uh, the Metropolitan Regional Services Plan Task Force, I wish to thank Mayor Ketcher and Council of Fort Saskatchewan for the opportunity to present to you today. And as Karen mentioned, I would also like to spend and send a big thanks out to uh, Councillor Harris for all the uh, time that he spent and supporting us through this project. He was a uh, he was an excellent member in the task force and uh, made, uh, had a lot of input, great input from him and support. So again, thank you, uh, Councillor Harris. In our time together, we'll share the, uh, we will share the work of the task force, advisory group, and technical working groups in development of the inaugural EMRB 2019 Metropolitan Regional Servicing Plan Report and MRSP. I also wish to acknowledge the expertise, commitment, and hard work demonstrated by the members of the task force, as well as the advisory and working groups in making tremendous progress on behalf of all the municipalities in our region. We look forward to hearing comments and feedback from Council to further inform and refine this important work. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to provide you with a brief over overview of the MRSP and for you to understand my involvement, not just in providing leadership to this initiative through my role as chair, but in my champion the objectives and intended outcomes we seek to achieve through the MRSP. Mayor Ralph, can I just yeah. interrupt you and see if you can speak a little closer to your microphone? You're just breaking up a bit, please. Thank okay. you. Uh, let me know if this doesn't, if this, uh, is that better? That, so that sounds better. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. The MRSP report represents a significant milestone in the development of our servicing plan and in fulfillment of our mandate under the provincial Provincial Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board Regulations. The MRSP is an essential tool to support the ongoing implementation of the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Growth Plan. Our work in developing the MRSP represents our commitment in the region to achieve responsible growth and ensure many municipal services needed to support and enhance the quality of life for all of our residents and are effective, sustainable, and remain affordable for current and future generations. Of, of course, as you know, as mayor of the town of Devon, I represent a municipality with a population of just over 6,500 residents. Of the 13 municipalities which compromise the Edmonton metropolitan region, Devon is the smallest municipality represented on, at our board. Yet we share the same very same demands and pressures experienced across the region. The ability for our town to respond to challenges as we face are limited. So we simply don't have the capacity nor the resources to respond all by ourselves. This is true not just for the town of Devon, but for all the municipalities in the region, whether small or large. And while we may formally draw municipal borders, fires, storms, other emergency services do not respect such boundaries. Through working together, we can improve our ability and capacity to be responsive across boundaries and throughout the Edmonton metropolitan region. Working to coordinate and optimize municipal services in these those municipal service areas where it makes sense to do so not only helps reduce duplication and inefficiencies, it allows us to increase our collective cast capability capacities and improve our ability to be responsive. By leveraging regional economies of scale and working collaboratively, we can maximize the value and benefits received, residents receive through the expenditures of public funds, lessen the burden to taxpayers, and achieve more working together than we could working alone. We simply must work together in order to do more with less and plan smartly for the municipal services required to support the anticipated growth in the region. The metropolitan region, region is forecast to add an additional 1 million residents and almost a half a million new jobs in the next 25 years. And I know due to COVID that may be, uh, they may be due to adjusted, but nevertheless, we're still going to grow over the future. So um, the uh, so given the forecasted growth in the region, the challenges municipalities will face only continue to increase and the municipality services infrastructure needed to keep up with such growth, growth will place a significant demand on muni limited municipal services. 
And while our challenges will grow ever more complex, the very core foundation of our proposed solution is a simple one. Through the MRSP, we will work smarter and better together. In presenting today, we hope to demonstrate a clear path forward to a more efficient and cost-effective regional future and set the direction for the next phase of regional collaboration in priority municipal service areas, including solid waste management, stormwater management, emergency management, and fire EMS. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide my perspective, and I look forward to Karen and Sharon to provide you with the details. Thank you again. Great, thank you very much, Mayor Ralph. And thank you for chairing, chairing this board. Uh, we'll go on to Sharon. Uh, Mayor Ralph, I'll get you to mute now. And uh, following the presentation, we'll go into any questions. So go ahead, Sharon. Uh, thank you, Mayor Ralph and uh, Mayor Ketcher and members of council. Uh, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here today on behalf of the EMRB to present the background, context, outcomes, and next steps for this regional initiative. The development of a Metropolitan Region Servicing Plan was identified as a new requirement in the 2017 EMRB regulation. And in it, it included the objectives that we were to achieve in, in this inaugural MRSP. The uh, regulation required us to identify the services required to support the goals of the uh, growth plan, to also support the optimization of shared services to enhance use of rapier dollars and to facilitate orderly, economical, and environmentally responsible growth in the region, and to coordinate planning and decisions regarding services among member municipalities to ensure we can optimize ratepayer dollars. The regulation also included guidance with respect to the contents of the servicing plan and included an initial list of services to be considered in this work. They listed transportation, including roads and regional transit, um, water, wastewater, stormwater, solid waste, emergency services, and also had the caveat that any other services identified by the board that would benefit regions, or sorry, uh, residents of the region um, should be considered. So the need for a servicing plan comes down to planning for essential infrastructure and services in alignment with the growth plan, focusing in on those regional opportunities to coordinate, harmonize, and streamline regionally significant services. This work has been developed under the guidance of a board appointed task force and supported by subject matter experts from across member municipalities, augmented with service providers and consultants. The extent of the engagement has been quite broad and encompassing and is included in Appendix E of the servicing plan. The first deliverable of the MRSP was to complete a comprehensive environmental scan to better understand the current state of all services outlined in the region. Upon a thorough review of the results of the environmental scan, the task force recommended the inaugural MRSP, MRSP focus on three specific services, which further became four, which Mayor Ralph just outlined, stormwater, solid waste, fire EMS, and emergency services. For the remaining four service areas, service areas the task force recognized that current mechanisms existing entities and regional partnerships already exist and are working effectively to plan for future growth in the region and therefore have been excluded from this initial plan. But the board, but the task force did discuss if there was any change, significant regional change in any one of these services, the board would reserve the right to reconsider those implications as part of the MRSP. The, the inaugural MRSP took two years to develop and in December of 2019, the board unanimously approved this plan. And on May the 14th, they approved a terms of reference to establish a standing committee to oversee the implementation of this work. More recently on January, sorry, June 11th, the board approved the appointment of a five member standing committee to include a representative from the city of St. Albert, the city of Edmonton, Leduc County, Strathcona County, and the town of Devon. MRSP represents a significant addition to the board's mandate, and it is intended to facilitate important regional conversations about how best to plan and coordinate the delivery of essential regional and municipal services and infrastructure. 
In fact, you'll find numerous references under Appendix C as to the extent to which all of the service areas are interrelated with the six policy areas of the growth plan. In its simplest form, the intent of the MRSP is to create the conditions for this region to optimize specific services with the potential to realize greater efficiencies from working together. For some additional background and context, we speak a lot about the growth plan. The 30-year regional growth plan was approved by the province in October of 2017. It's an important regional plan. The plan also provides an integrated and holistic policy approach to planning for the future based on six integrated policy areas, economic competitiveness and employment, natural living systems, communities and housing, the integration of land use and infrastructure, transportation systems, and agriculture. The bubbles on this slide summarize the outcomes we're working towards and listed on the right hand side are the key strategies to inform all of the policies and the outcomes. Note the use of the language, such as compact development, meaning smaller urban footprints are based on higher densities, complete communities where residents can live, work, and play, and a multimodal transportation systems. These outcomes are key to the thinking and the planning for the future and provide a lot of the rationale for why we need to consider our infrastructure and our services under this new way of thinking. At this time, I want to point out that what we're working really represents an evolution. The servicing plan is the start of an important region of conversations about how we think and plan and respond to the challenges of managing future growth of the region and to ensure we are resilient and sustainable and foremost, pay attention to being globally economically competitive. Over the next 10 to 20 years, we expect this work will continue to evolve into a more robust plan based on our collective work and the implementation of strategic initiatives that we decide on based on evidence-based decision-making and the prioritization of the appropriate regional opportunities that we know will benefit this region and its citizens. I think it's important to be clear on what the MRSP is and is not to avoid any misunderstanding or confusion. First and foremost, it's a regional strategy at this point and a platform for a regional level conversation about how we can work together to effectively achieve the vision and the future state of this region. Secondly, it's a focused plan on regionally significant metropolitan services, which we have identified four to start with. It introduces a structured process and approach for ongoing regional collaboration led by subject matter experts. The work is guided by a set of guiding principles and it includes a framework for accountability to report on the progress and the outcomes of this work. All the details and more can be found within the MRSP report. On the flip side, what the MRSP is not is a plan for all metropolitan services nor is it a replacement for existing important and effective local and sub-regional plans, planning and service delivery entities. We want to leverage that expertise in these conversations. It's also not intended to define services or service levels for diverse rural and urban communities. It's also not a plan that defines or directs future local capital and operating plans for infrastructure investments. Finally, it's not a replacement for many important and effective initiatives being led sub-regionally among municipalities involving other stakeholders and important partners. As per the direction of the task force, the standing up of four collaboratives will be staged over the course of 2020, starting with solid waste. Foundational work to guide the work of these collaboratives has been completed in the form of action plans for each of the collaboratives, as well as service area profiles, and are included under Appendix A of the document. I want to just give you some context about regional collaboratives in terms of who they are and what they're intended to accomplish. I would describe them as an extension of the technical working groups assembled for the initial work on the inaugural MRSP, with the addition of a representative from each member municipality. Their role is to lead in the regional collaboration discussions for each of the service areas centered around the defined action plans found on page 30 and 32 in the MRSP. The expected outcomes are to advance the service areas regionally 
starting with gathering and sharing and optimizing regionally relevant data and information to support more effective decision making and building consensus around regional projects and initiatives. And they're responsible to develop a framework to identify additional areas deemed to be of regional significance for consideration by the task force, by the, sorry, the standing committee. Um, responsible to provide, report and provide guidance uh, to the MRS standing committee on projects to support the implementation and the growth plan. This, uh, the collaboratives will be comprised of non-elected officials and will include subject matter experts for the service areas from each of the 13 member municipalities. Participation um, uh, uh, under the direction of the task force, the participation uh, is mandatory for member municipalities to participate in the regional collaboratives, but the projects will be optional even when they're approved by the board. Lastly, the time commitment is anticipated to involve roughly four to six meetings per year or as needed and directed by the standing committee. Guiding principles established by the task force are a reflection of the forward thinking and thought leadership that went into this work. These principles will inform the values and behaviors and set the expectations for how we approach this work. Starting at the top, it's about the big picture and adopting a regional mindset, meaning we recognize we are all one interconnected metropolitan region and collectively benefit from leveraging our strengths and wisdom around the table. Our work is based on pursuing leading and innovative research, technology, and best practices, and to further build on, collect, and share regionally relevant data, information, and knowledge. We want to prioritize regional scale service investments informed by evidence and make sure that we have an, um, can prove and demonstrate a return on investment. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to leverage all the great work underway sub regionally that could benefit the region. We want to recognize the unique rural and urban contexts which require different solutions to factor in safety and the wellness of the regional citizen. And it's really built on the principle of accountability to measure the measure and report results from servicing efficiency and effectiveness to councils and citizens, and obviously to act in a regional manner in a regional uh, with a unified voice. The outcomes of the MRSP are closely aligned to the guiding principles and will be a reflection of the region's commitment to working together in the form of establishing a strong baseline of information in the form of harmonized data and information, sharing of regional evidence-based decision-making for service planning, investment, and delivery. In time, realize the value of seamless and optimized service delivery, ensuring appropriate service levels where needed, efficient and cost-effective regional investments, which can be supported by all levels of government, be a globally recognized metropolitan servicing, leveraging best practices, technology, and innovation services, and um, be able to demonstrate effective engagement of stakeholders throughout our processes, and be ensure that we are an investment ready region for business growth and investment attraction. The list of outcomes is predicated on planning without borders to achieve enhanced community safety, livability, sustainability, and cost effectiveness. So our next steps are simply to proceed with the implementation of the governance structure, and then obviously proceed with standing up the regional collaboratives. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for your presentation, Sharon. Uh, so with that, uh, what we do is uh, we just go through our rotation list and uh, allow for questions. So Councillor Harris, you're first on questions in the speaking order. Can you unmute? Councillor Harris, can you unmute? There. Uh, I have no questions. I'm uh, conversing with all of the stuff that's in the background report. Involved in it. Uh, it, was a, it was a worthwhile experience. I enjoyed working with uh, Mayor Ralph and the other members, including the MRB thing. So I have no questions. So thank you very much. And it was a worthwhile experience. Great. Thank you. Councillor Sperling. Thanks for the presentation, Sharon. Just a uh, quick question. The, the group that is included in this, uh, in the MSRP, are the, all these needs to mute, the 13 municipalities, sorry, 
the 13 municipalities that are included in the EMRB, correct? Those are sorry. the ones I'm just, Well, good. sorry, Councillor Sperling, I was just asking Sharon to mute. So if you can re-ask your question, because I think we're getting the background noise from there. So if you can re-ask, thank you. Thanks again, Sharon, for the presentation. Just so this, this would include, of course, the 13 municipalities that make up the EMRB. Um, number one, just clarifying that. And number two, just uh, regarding the services that are being looked at right now under this new uh, task force, we have four services identified going forward. Will there be consideration to add additional services into this program or this project? Thanks. So your first question was uh, who, who makes up the MRSP collaboratives? And yes, it is a representative from each of the 13 member municipalities. And then your second question was the opportunity to add additional services. I think that that would certainly um, be a consideration. And I think uh, if there was additional services besides what's on the list that would go forward through to the standing committee. Maybe Karen and uh, Mayor Ralph may have other comments to that. I'll just jump in. Um, I think what we heard um, through Sharon's presentation and what the task force mentioned to the board was if there was an if there was a point in time when there was something that the board identified that was needed, um, that certainly the board reserved the right to bring that forward through um, either a conversation directly at the board level, or it could be something that was certainly identified at the standing committee that would come through to the board, but it would be a decision, of course, that would come forward through elected officials at the board. And if I could just add to this, I'm not sure if you can hear or not. Um, the discussion when we first started the task force was to, uh, we were looking at all service areas and what it came down to is we decided that as a group, we could only do so much. Again, we're limited resources, limited time, where was the biggest bang for our buck actually is where where we start where we came from and that's when we ended up with the th initial three which was fire uh fire ems um storm water management and solid waste management those were the areas that we felt that we could get the biggest bang for our buck right now and focus on then the um emergency services sort of came after that through our through our uh through our investigations and discussions through working groups and everything that fire EMS versus emergency services was actually two separate areas. And so they we needed to, uh, if we're going to continue on down the path on those, on the fire EMS, we should be splitting it out. So we decided as a, as a task force to actually add that in. So we ended up with four service areas. But moving forward, we also realized that there would be other services in the future that we may need to look at. And so we're not, we never limited ourselves moving forward. But again, we want to make sure that we do the best we can on the service areas that we focus on right now. And then once we also actually took it to the next step and said, okay, what service, where do we want to start with all this? And number one service area, which again, when we're looking at the everything that's happening around us, ended up being solid waste management. That is where we're going to start the process. Because solid waste management was an issue for all 13 regions, 13 municipalities. And it's also an area where there's so many different projects that have been looked at by different municipalities. It's time to get the experts in the room and come up with some solutions and recommendations so that we can work together as a region and come up with the solutions that's going to benefit everybody. So, um, so that's a, kind of give you a little bit of background on how the uh, the, the uh, uh, team worked through this and established the, the what we're focused on now moving forward. Are you good, Councillor Sperling? Yes, okay. thanks for those answers. Okay, thank you very much. I'm next in the speaking order. So just to confirm though, the collaboratives that you're setting up, A, you said that was non-elected, uh, so it's technical people from each municipality, and B, are they all being, they're not all being stood up uh, at the same time, is that correct? I'm seeing heads. Actually, no. Uh, we're not standing up all four at one time. We're actually staggering the startup again, mainly because of resources and time, etc. 
So the first one, as I said we, earlier, we, we were going to start up the solid waste first. That's going to be the first um, first uh, collaborative that we're we're setting up. And then what we'll do is work. Yeah, the EMRB administration is going to be working with the with the um, through and come up with recommendations on on the rollout of the other three collaboratives. Okay, and then my next question comes to the point that um, there is a capital region waste minimization committee advisory. Are you going to be able to, are we going to utilize those as the technical people? Um, because it seems, feels like that they've been trying to do this work for how many years with no success. So I guess the question that I have is, are we going to be able to utilize them or will they fold and then come into a new fold? Can you just what? talk talk about that? Kind of with my past experience with uh, the Edmonton way, the minimization, they've been they've come up with a lot of great things in the past, but unfortunately, they didn't have the mandate or anything to do anything with with some of the stuff they came up with. So I'm sure that moving forward, they will be you know they will be invited in to be participants in the collaboratives um, because again, they do have a lot of expertise and a lot of experience. Um, plus, uh, you know, it will probably go again. Um, it'll go open to all the different waste management authorities, Leduc and District Waste Management Authority. Maybe they'll have somebody that uh, will be part of it. Um, so again, these are the those are the type of people we want to make sure are in the collaboratives. So because again, it's the expertise that we want, and the people that understand the region now and can make make recommendations. So we're not having to spend years and years just trying to understand the region, but we want to get the experts in the room and and get a better understanding of what, what the region is and working together. That's that's how I believe we're going to uh, accomplish things a lot more efficient and a lot more quicker. Great, thank you very much for that explanation. And uh, just before I go on to the next one, I do want to thank Councillor Harris. Uh, he was an excellent uh, alternate. I was at one and a half meetings, but each meeting I had to leave early and he always is sitting there as the alternate stepped in and he actually, because he was spending more time uh, actually filling in, he just continued on. So thank you very much for your good work. So it kind of ended up, I ended up being your alternate. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Lennox. Thank you for the presentation. And yeah, I, I too was, uh, I didn't realize that Councillor Harris was so deeply involved in this project. So it's interesting. Um, my question is, when you talk about standing up these regional, regional collaboratives, does that mean that the vision is to eventually move to a commission type model for all of these services? Mayor Ralph, I don't know if you want to take that or if you'd like me to take that. That's the last couple of times, so I'll give it to Karen. Great. So, Councillor Lennox, I, I don't actually know that we know what um, will happen as, as we move forward with each one of these. I think the beauty of the collaboratives is that everyone actually comes to the table to share best practice and information and data. And so at the very, at the very least, it really is about um, raising the bar and raising the game of all member municipalities in the region. From that, I think there will be, um, the idea is there may be projects or initiatives that start to emerge from the collaboratives. And of course, those are voluntary. And so it will only be member municipalities who wish to participate in those um, that will join into those initiatives. Um, whether or not a commission emerges out of any of this work, I think uh, time will tell on that because that's really then moving into a governance and operation structure. And it may be that um, that some of the work is so powerful and is is so well underway that it's the right thing to do to spin it out. But I think that that will be a decision of uh, a recommendation coming through the standing committee and, and through the board. And of course, if we think back to why are we having a standing committee, this is a new committee of the board. The board hasn't had a committee like this. It's because the task force recommended to the board and then the board felt so strongly that this work was important that we needed to make sure that it was moving forward and i think you know we'll all learn through this and through the recommendations 
of of the standing committee. So I, you know, it will be something that I think we'll see emerge over time, and um, and I look forward to the great outcomes of this. So I'm sorry that there's not more of a definitive answer around that, but I think you know that will really be um, a governance decision that comes through the standing committee to the board. So because just um, reading all of this and, and kind of taking this all in and taking it all in over the last two and a half years, it seems to me that this is kind of a prelude and a, um, kind of a starting point to regional governance. Um, is that is that kind of the overall vision of where the MRB is going? I don't think that we've kind of talked in terms, if you're thinking about regional governance in a formalized kind of way, I think that what we have is a demonstration of really strong ability to work together and spin things out that seem to make sense. So I'm not sure that it would be anything different than something that might happen like an Edmonton Global or something that might happen like a transit commission. But that's down the road because I mean, right now I, I'd say where we are is we're standing up regional collaboratives to share best practice and data. Like that's the start of what a collaborative is. And then projects that come out of that are opt-in, right? I mean, it's not something that's mandatory. So I think um, regional governance to me is something that is so far down the road, we're walking, we're not running. And I think that, you know, we, as I look at all of the initiatives that we have underway, Mayor Catcher is chairing the integrated transportation master plan. We have a regional agriculture master plan. All of these, of course, emerge from the growth plan. And with the, the MRSP, it's a part of our mandate. And so I think that to speak about regional governance is a conversation that certainly in my 18 months of being here, we haven't had conversations like that at the board. We're really talking about how do we work together and how do we accelerate outcomes for citizens of this region by leveraging scales of economy and thinking about efficiencies. That's the conversation that I think we're having right now. Mayor Catcher, Mayor Ralph, you're at the board table. I mean, would you, is there anything that you would add to that? Yeah. If I was to add anything, I would say that I see the Edmonton um, uh, EMRB as a place where things become incubated and then they develop out of there and then it becomes optional for people if they want to opt in or opt out. So, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. Edmonton Global and the Transit Commission are two great examples of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do believe there are options, but I don't see this as being a regional uh, governing board. It's it's a place to come together and have great mindsets and see where we can be prosperous as, as an entire region. Mayor Ralph? Um, no, you two have basically covered it off. Uh, the, whole, the whole concept behind, this is an inaugural art. Uh, MRSP as well. So the the concept or the thoughts behind this is this is a first stage. Um, the you know if you look at the document and everything, there's actually a couple more stages beyond this in future years of how this will develop. But right now we're not uh, you know the the whole concept and the, everything behind this is just working together and be more cost efficient. Take and listen to the people, get the get the knowledge in, of the the people in the same rooms and try and do the best we can for all of our residents in the region. Not just, uh, not look. we were not looking or discussing anything as a regional governance model. That is something that uh, none of us were, you know, have had that discussion. Um, the, you know, it's what, it's what it comes down to, bottom line is regional cooperation and collaboration to improve the services for our residents. Yeah, I, I appreciate your comments and everybody else's, but I do, if you take, you know, you say it's volunteer to join some of these things, but if you take a bunch of municipalities within the region and set up all of these um, uh, commissions and committees, you may not have one regional governing body, but 
the decision making power within the region shifts from the municipal government to a regional perspective. And that's my only point. So when I, I just see that I think you're absolutely right. I do think that this is a starting point and I do have some concerns with how it, it moves forward, but that's, that's just me and I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Councillor Macon. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Karen and Sharon, and for being here today, Mayor Ralph. Thank you very much. Um, so just kind of looking into what's next then, um, looks like you have some government governance structure coming up, establishing the collaboratives as we spoke about. Um, has a timeline been created all? What, what can we expect in terms of when do we get to start seeing some real diving into the solid waste discussion happening? Maybe I'll jump in and then um, Sharon might be able to fill in some of the blanks. So the standing committee, I believe um, we have sent out uh, a meeting request for the standing committee right away. So the board committee is standing up and will have its first meeting, I believe, July. And then after that, um, the first of the collaboratives, as Mayor Ralph has suggested. So we'll ask member municipalities, we'll, we'll meet with the st standing committee, we'll ask member municipalities to identify their subject matter experts, and we will begin uh, the standing up of the first one immediately thereafter. And you'll see that in the MRSP itself is some outlines of some of some terms of reference or what the collaboratives will be doing. So all of that has already been approved um, by the by the original task force and and by the board. And so as we have thought about how do we stand this up, the things that we keep in mind are. Um, burden on member municipalities, so making sure that we're not asking too much. And I know um, there some municipalities are smaller than others, and they don't have the the capability to take everything on at once. So we're being very thoughtful as it comes as we as we think about this. And as Sharon mentioned, we think there are about four to six meetings a year to start. Um, and and the way that the collaboratives are set up is is that generally it's different people who will be called upon to participate in this because you've got solid waste and then you know your emergency services or fire and and stormwater so hopefully we won't be we'll be doing this in a thoughtful way um, but that you'll be seeing the outcomes of this very shortly and that's the whole reason why we have the standing committee was the task force wanted to ensure that this didn't get lost and that best practice and and benefits to citizens throughout the region were being realized as quickly as possible. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you everybody for your for your time and your presentation today. Uh, I think I've understood everything that you folks have had to say, but I'm stumbling and I need clarification, please. I'm looking at page two of three of your written report, the bullet points, and it's the very bottom one on page two that I don't understand. Um, could you, it starts, the amended motion was passed in recognition by the board. Um, could you put that in, in smaller words and simpler language so I could understand what, what the intent and the mechanism is, please? Thank you. Councilor, are you referring to the actual MRSP report or something I said that was presented today? Because I think we included the present. No, I'm looking at the written report material that Council was given and specifically page two of three, the, not, the over, not the PowerPoint presentation, but the, the type stuff titled Metropolitan Regional Service and Plan Briefing Note, oh. June 23. That sounds like it's an administrative uh, report, and I haven't seen that. Like written by your administration, is that where it came? Is that the origin? Uh, I doubt it. It's from MRSP. Uh, it looks to me like you know. I believe it's the briefing notes that were sent out. Correct. That uh, mirror catcher that you would have got from uh, from EMRB administration. Yes. Troy, can you just confirm? Because they've got EMRB servicing plan briefing notes. Yeah, Your Worship, that's a, that's a document that's from um, uh, EMRB. 
Okay, um, and Councillor Kelly, can you just uh, just help us? And um, can you please read what it is uh, you would like clarified again, please? I don't have the briefing note in front of me. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, Councillor Kelly, you're on mute. Okay. Thank you. I thought it clicked off, but I must have it twice. So the wording is, the amended motion was passed in recognition by the board that such direction and oversight is specifically proposed. Some, I got feedback. Somebody needs to mute. Uh, I think you're referring to the motion that would have gone to the board in December where there would have been a larger proposal with respect to having this, that the standing committee would have oversight um, of the gr implementation of the growth plan in addition to the MRSP. And so the amended motion removed any oversight of the growth plan that might have been in the in initial. So that's what the amended motion I think is referring to. Um, going back to December. Karen. Uh, with respect, I'll tell you what, the better approach would be to, uh, to our administration, to yourselves. Okay. Get some feedback on what the intent and the meaning of this is, because what you just said doesn't quite jive with the words here. And I'm, if you okay. haven't seen it, you can respond. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. You're good. Councillor Abatoye? Oh, Councillor Kelly, did you have any more? Were you oh, good? I am good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Abatoye? Um, thank you for your presentation, Mayor Ralph, um, Ms. Shuya, and Ms. Wichok. Um, so I sat on the um, the AIRWAC, so that, that will be the Edmonton Regional Waste Advisory Committee. And it's it's very good to hear that um, they're going to be included in this because they already have structure in place. So I think it will fit nicely into the MRSP. Um, so, but my question, I know that you had said, it's, it's been mentioned many times in, in the um, PowerPoint presentation as well as what you said, um, is that the MRSB is also responsible for implementing the growth plan or for supporting the vision. And this is probably out of scope for you, but I'm just wondering with the um, density target that's been imposed on municipalities through the growth plan, um, how does the MRSB how is the MRSP going to ease these pressures on municipalities? And this might be out of scope for you, but I'm just wondering if you have an answer to that. Thank you. Um, I, I'll just uh, try to uh, help answer that. Um, the, I don't think there's any, any intention of the MRSP relieving the pressure of the density targets. The density targets that are um, in the growth plan have been agreed to by the member municipalities as a way to uh, facilitate future growth in a more, um, I guess, responsible way. So it's introducing higher densities in all communities uh, so that we can actually save land. And you can imagine if we change the built form, that does have a direct relationship to infrastructure, which is the focus of the MRSP. A good example is um, the higher densities uh, places a, a different lens on fire services when you introduce um, higher buildings in, in member community, communities. And so that's where these two, um, I guess, plans come together. So the MRSP is in, intended to um, make sure that the infrastructure requirements are aligned with the growth plan because the growth plan is introducing a different way in which we've all agreed to grow, which is uh, first and foremost considering going up before going out and infilling before we're taking on, on, on new land. So that's kind of the, the premise behind the whole thing. So I know what you're, I think what you're thinking of is how does it, the MRSP remove the requirement to, to implement the densities? It doesn't. It just, it's, it's just a different lens in which we have to look at as we plan and build out our communities because it, it affects services. Is that help? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I always have to hit that unmute button. Uh, good. Thank you very much for your presentation. If there's any follow-up questions, uh, Council uh, could submit them to administration and uh, we could get them back to you and, and uh, have any, any final 
uh, answers if there is any requirements. But, uh, oh, uh, uh, Ms. Woodchuck, would you like to uh, do some concluding remarks as the executive director? I can, and, and Mayor Catcher, if it is okay with you, I can actually answer Councillor Kelly's question. Um, because I do have that briefing note in front of me and I can speak to what it is that uh, was referred to. All right, so you can answer that and then you can just do your concluding sure. remarks. Sure, right, I'm happy you. to do that. So Councillor Kelly, um, the motion that is referred to in the briefing note, when um, the MRSP standing committee was uh, recommended to the board, um, it's being done so at a time when the board is actually looking at its own governance and there's a, a new board charter um, that, that the board has been working on. And that board charter looks at all of the committees of the board, including um, what is currently the executive committee and the audit and finance committee. And so what the amended motion was speaking to is the recognition that the board would stand up the MRSP standing committee at this particular moment of time, but did reserve the right over time to broaden the scope of that committee to look at all of the strategic initiatives. So to, to um, take a look at how the strategic initiatives of the whole were being integrated and that um, it may over time turn into something that is not just a, a standing committee looking at the MRSP, but maybe a standing committee that looks at the implementation of other strategic initiatives underway. So it could be uh, what come what results from the IRTMP, the transportation master plan. It might oversee and look at the implementation of uh, the regional agriculture master plan. And so that motion in itself was referring to um, the board in a, in a future state looking at its governance and what the role of this committee would be. I hope that answers. Councillor Kelly, does that answer your question? Uh, it certainly helps. Thank you. So, to paraphrase, it's, a, it's possible then that the role of the standing committee could be brought going forward at a date yet to be determined. And if that is the case, how often, what, what's the term, proposed term of the standing committee? Does it change out annually, every four years? Uh, how would the, the, the mechanics of the actual committee work? Thank you. So um, right now, I believe it is, am I, um, I'm unmuted, is that right? Yes. So right now, I believe, um, and Sharon can correct me if I'm wrong, it's a two-year um, time period. And that's generally how all of our committees work, um, is, is around uh, changing around two years. And you're right. So um, it could be something that then leads to, uh, and it's it's like an accountabilities committee. Are we doing the work that we said that we were gonna do on the strategic initiatives? And so that was really what the idea behind that is, if it broadens out. But what the board decided on December the 12th was that they wanted to start with a committee that was specific to the MRSP and over time did reserve the right to to broaden it out um, in terms of what those that what that term would look like who would sit on it how big it would be if that's the case then the terms of reference for the committee would be rewritten and would be taken back to the board for approval so we wouldn't do it it wouldn't be something that just happened it would be something that would have to go back to the board and so i can't speak to what a future committee um, might look like okay thank you very much Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Ms. Woodchuck, any final concluding remarks? None whatsoever, just thank you for the time and, um, and I look forward to uh, working with representatives from uh, the municipality of Fort Saskatchewan on the collaborative. Great, well, thank you very much, Mayor Ralph, Sharon Shuya and uh, Karen Woodchuck. Woodchuck uh, for your presentation this evening. And like I said, if there's any follow-up questions, we will get them to you. So thank you very much. All right, bye. Thank you. Okay, our next item on the agenda. All right, just give them a second to leave. The uh, next item on the agenda is Council Committee Appointments Policy and Procedure Gov-017-C. Uh, now this was referred, so there is an amending motion on the floor. Um, 
at this time. So, um, uh, Mr. Fleming, do you want to speak to what uh, what has transpired since then? And then, Your we'll Worship, go... I do have some of that uh, in my presentation, just explaining the process for the motions. Okay, thank you. I was just looking to see who was going to be speaking first. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Your Worship and members of Council, I'm once again presenting the proposed Council Appointments Policy and Procedure at today's Council meeting to provide information, to respond to members' clarifying questions, and to request that Council adopt both policy and procedures, Gov17-C. On October 22, 2019, Council approved a motion to request that administration provide information, clarification, and alternatives on the Council member committee appointment process. The proposed policy and procedure were drafted based on comments made from Council, feedback from other municipalities, legislative requirements, and best practices. These documents were presented to the May 19th Committee of the Whole meeting for feedback, and those comments at the meeting were incorporated where appropriate. In addition, these documents were presented at the June 7th Council meeting to request adoption. At the meeting, an amendment was presented to Section 4.5 of the policy to include the wording, ex officio non-voting. This was in relation to the mayor's attendance at committee meetings. This sparked quite a bit of discussion on the interpretation of the amendment and the item was referred back to administration for further review. As presented, additional or clarifying information has been included in the policy and procedure and highlighted in red. Following the meeting, administration reviewed the background and uh, received legal advice on the matter. The impacts of the amendment, as stated, would mean that the mayor could attend committee meetings if permitted by that organization, but would not be permitted to vote. It should also be noted that the mayor's ex officio status does not extend to those organizations which were formed by legislation other than the Municipal Government Act. For example, commissions, foundations, and boards. In those cases, the organization's bylaws and terms of reference would determine if an ex officio member were permitted to attend meetings. This, however, would not be the case for those committees where the mayor was specifically named as the appointed member, such as the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board. It should also be mentioned that the mayor's ex officio status does not have any impact on the ability for her to attend a committee meeting or have voting rights on behalf of an absent member. If the mayor or another member of council wish to attend a meeting on behalf of an absent member, their attendance would be dependent on the specific committee's bylaws or terms of reference. Ex officio status and attendance on behalf of an absent member are two separate circumstances. It should be noted that when Council deliber deliberated this item previously, there were two motions that were made at the June 9th meeting, but were not yet called for a vote. In the report, motions one is the original motion, sorry, is the uh, Councillor Kelly's amended motion, and number three, is the original motion made, which would be then as amended. Motion number two is an administrative recommendation um, for an amendment to section, adding section 4.6 to the policy to include wording for members attending a meeting on behalf of an absent member. And then motion four requests the adoption of the council committee appointments procedure. And with that, I would be happy to respond to your questions. Okay, thank you. Because um, we actually do have a motion, uh, motion that is on the table. We have to deal with the amending motion first. That's correct. Before we can uh, speak about the second one, but it uh, is germane to it. So we had left off with Councillor Lennox. Uh, you had put the referral motion on. I'm gonna switch my sheets to where we had left off in speaking order. Uh, so that we make sure that everybody has had an opportunity to speak to the amendments. So, Councillor Lennox, 
you put the referral on, so um, you would be first to speak. So this would be based on the information that's provided, and this is only on the um, amending motion. So the first, the first amending motion. Okay. That was that was Councillor Kelly's amending motion. So that was what was still on the floor. Okay. So we have to deal with that first. And okay. because you put the referral motion on, you didn't have an opportunity to speak to the amending motion. So, okay, I don't have anything else. I'll support the motion. Whoops. Sorry, Councillor Macon on the amending motion. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, and just because we're in a public meeting, can you can you please just state what the original motion is? and the amendment just so it's all clear on this video feed so the original motion was to approve the uh, council committee appointments policy and procedure gov dash zero one seven dash c and then uh, councillor kelly put an amending motion on uh, that reads that council amend policy gov zero one seven dash c section four point five to add the words ex officio non-voting and that's and then, all we're dealing and with. Councillor right Lennox's now. amendment, or are we we're dealing with Councillor Kelly's? Sorry. <laughs> no. So Councillor Lennox had just put the referral motion on, so it was referred right. to this okay. meeting. That's yeah. done. Now we've lifted this off the table, and we're dealing with the amending motion. All right. I have no comments on that amendment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Okay, I'm just going to go straight through the list. Councillor Kelly on the amending motion. I thought it made sense then, and uh, it makes sense even more now today. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Abatoye. I have nothing to say. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harris. No further comments. Thank you. Councillor Sperling. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I just need clarification on this. So on 4.5, so as non-voting, uh, and you indicated to so it, boards, commissions, uh, that those ones are still based, are just based on their policies uh, as they were in the past. Nothing changed on that? Uh, Your Worship, um, for those um, that have their a different uh, legal entity, which are a different legal entity uh, outside the Municipal Government Act, it would defer to their um, bylaws and terms of reference whether um, w the attendance would be acceptable for an ex officio. But primarily the ex officio is for those committees that are listed or as part of the Municipal Government Act. Okay. Okay. I just want to double check on that. Okay, thank you. So I will come back to Councillor Kelly to close on your uh, amending motion. I have nothing further to add. Uh, makes sense. So I suggest we move on with the vote. Thank you. Thank you. So the vote is now closed at uh, Council Amend Policy Gov 017-C Section 4.5 to add words ex officio non-voting. Please cast your vote. That is carried unanimously. Thank you. So now we will go back. Um, okay, thank you. So now we will go back to uh, motion number two, which is a new motion that has been added and I'm going to go back to our um, back to the original speaking order on this. So the next motion is that Council Amend Policy Gov 017-C by adding a new section 4.6 that the mayor or another member may attend committee meetings and receive voting rights on behalf of an absent member if permitted by that committee's bylaw or terms of reference. Councillor uh, Harris, you're first in the speaking order on this one. No question, no comments. Thank you. Councillor Sperling. I have no questions either. Thank you. 
Okay, I do have a question on this one. So the way this is written, and when I looked at this, so the mayor or another member may attend the committee meetings and receive voting rights. Question is, who's going to make the decision who's going to attend if somebody's not there? Um, your worship and members of council, um, as, as we know, we, working through this, many of our uh, processes were not put in writing. It was just something that had happened as far as the appointments. Um, I think something, if, if additional clarity was requested by council, we could add a sub to uh, 4.6a stating, um, in the event that an appointed member is unable to attend a committee meeting, the mayor shall select a member to attend the committee meeting on behalf of that absent member. Absent member. Um, so whether council wishes to leave that open that the mayor selects a member or if you wanted to refer to the deputy mayor if you wanted that to be standard language. That is also an option if you wanted further clarity to who selects those okay. members. Okay, and I guess the other question that I have on that is, would we just not be safer to have an alternate for uh, each person? Like, so for the library board to have one alternate for Heartland Housing, the, you know, just appoint an alternate and then it's the responsibility of the primary member to ensure their alternate is aware when they're not attending? Would that not make easier? To your worship, and, and in many cases that does happen. We do often, many committees uh, do have alternate members appointed at the organizational meeting. Um, there are just some that maybe the member and alternate member are absent. Um, so there may be the rare instance where somebody else may be needed. Okay, but I'm just looking for the determination of the who, and it's more cumbersome if you have to say the mayor has to appoint somebody, or it becomes the deputy mayor, or you know the rotation through mm -hmm. there. So right. I guess the question is, should this just be that there is an additional alternate for each one of them so that we do not lose our voting rights at each one of these? It, and, I, and I ask that because you have two representatives on uh, to um, some boards and committees and yet one person doesn't go and you potentially lose one of your your voting uh, one of your votes which could be important so that's the question that I have um, that that is that is a good point and again it does come down to that say the the water commission for example whether they would permit um, uh, just a, a non-appointed member I believe with the water commission the way that that particular um, appointment is is handled is we do um, the two members we do uh, both members and the letter that we provide to the water commission also does refer to the deputy mayor would attend that is specific to that organization uh, some committees have um, different specifications on the members and that's how we base our appointments uh, when we recommend them at the organizational meeting Okay, I'll, I'll just let this go for now so I can hear what other people have to say, but I've, I just find 4.6 is, is cumbersome. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Lennox? Thanks, Brenda. I think, um, I think it makes sense to just um, have the person who's on the committee be responsible to find somebody, and the deputy mayor list makes sense to me because that is what we use in other instances. So um, that would make sense to me. And and if the deputy mayor can't make it and then you go down the list like we do otherwise. So that's, that's what I would suggest. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Macon. Uh, yeah, I guess I don't have any comments on the motion other than, I guess, just to agree with Councillor Lennox and I believe in what the mayor said, just um, wording that just says in the absence of the main member, it falls to the alternate. And if a committee doesn't have an alternate, it goes to the deputy mayor rotation. That's, I think that that's pretty simple and straightforward. Okay. 
Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. I'm good with the wording as it sits. Accepted practice could be could be the deputy mayor. Uh, I don't think we have to make it any more complicated than it is at, at the particular juncture. So let's see how it works, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, Councillor uh, Abatoye. Um, so I, I believe the process we do right now is when people are unable to attend their meetings, they are responsible for finding the person that can um, replace them. Um, so I, I believe that we can go ahead with this. Um, but I also like the point that uh, Mayor Kacha made about having alternates on, like I sit on library board and I, I don't have an alternate. I mean, for those um, boards that have no alternates, we can look at um, introducing alternates at the next organizational meeting. That's what I'll say. Um, just to that point, you know, to your worship, to Councillor Abatoye, I think the library board is unique in that they only they were very specific to what to the membership. I don't believe they would permit an alternate. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to go through this again, Councillor Harris. Uh, yeah, I think that starts to come become messy. The um, Wastewater Commission voted specifically to amend its bylaws so that there's one appointed member for each municipality and uh, there are no alternates because it was deemed uh, by the board as a whole that there needed to be continuity in the decision making process so in that case given the fact that they are under different legislation the mga they uh, felt that that was appropriate and each other commission can do whatever they want but it this is what are we doing about the appointment of, of alternates? And I think where an alternate is required, it's on the list. And uh, then the primary member, if they can't be there, uh, talks to the alternate. And the alternate shows up if they're available. If not, it's it's uh, it's kind of a nullity at that point. So that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to go through the list again. Councillor Sperling, did you have anything further? I don't think I have anything to add. I do like Gord's perspective on it, though. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, when we come to the motion, um, when uh, a person puts the motion on, you can put it on the way it is, or you can uh, make any modifications to it. That's your choice. Um, Councillor Lennox, do you have anything further? I have nothing further, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Macon? Do you want me just to make the motion, or...? No, no, in the rotation order, it'll get made. Okay, no, no okay. comments. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kelly, anything further? Nothing further, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Abatoy, anything further? No, I'm good, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harris, do you wish to put the motion on? No, I would defer to the next person in rotation. Thank you. Councillor Sperling, you're next in rotation. Can you unmute, please? So this is the motion concerning council committee appointments, policy and procedure. Um, your worship to Councillor Sperling, I believe it's motion, the motion as listed is number two. The council amend? Yes, All that's right. correct. So I'll put the motion on that council amend policy GOV-017-C by adding a new section 4.6. The mayor or another member may attend committee meetings and receive voting rights on behalf of an absent member if permitted by that committee's bylaws or terms of reference. Okay, I'll accept the motion. Do you wish to speak in favor of it? Uh, yes, uh, I uh, I will speak in favor of it. I believe that uh, that uh, we want to uh, take advantage of any voting right that we may have on on a committee as a as a council. And in the absence of the appointed member, um, if another can attend on their behalf, then uh, that makes sense to me. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much. On discussion and debate, I have none. Councillor Lennox, I'm good. Thank you. I'll support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Macon. No comments. Uh, Councillor Kelly on the motion. Uh, nothing to add, thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Harris on the motion. Uh, nope. Okay, thank you, Councillor uh, Sperling. Anything on close? Nothing on close, thank you. Thank you, so the motion is now closed to amend the policy gov by adding section 4.6. Please cast your vote. That is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Now, I think the next item is going to be fairly lengthy. So I'm going to suggest we uh, take a break and oh, back in our oh, your, point, point of order, oh, Madam Mayor. Oh, yeah, we have, yeah, I'm sorry. We have number <laughs> three and number four. <laughs> All right, uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor uh, Sperling on item or number three. Go ahead. The council adopt. Council Committee Appointments Policy GOV-017-C is amended. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, the motion is open for discussion and debate. Um, Councillor Lennox, anything? No, I'm good. I'll support the motion. Councillor Macon? Nothing, thank you. Councillor Kelly? I'll support the motion. Pardon me. I'll support the motion. Nothing further to add. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Nothing. Thank you, Thank you. Councillor Harris. I have nothing as well. Okay. Anything on close, Councillor Sperling? Nothing, Tad. Thank you. Thank you. The motion is now closed. Uh, um, that Council adopt committee appointments gov dash zero one seven dash c is amended. Please cast your vote. That is carried unanimously, and you can go ahead with the procedural one, Councillor Sperling. The Council adopt Council Committee Appointments Procedure GOV-017-C. Thank you. Do you wish to speak in favor? Uh, no, support it, though. Thank you. Uh, it's open for discussion and debate. I have none. Councillor Lennox? Nothing, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Macon? I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Nothing further, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Nothing, thank you. Councillor Harris. Nothing, thank you. Thank you. All right, anything on close, Councillor Sperling? Nothing closed. Thank you. Then the motion is now closed. Please cast your vote. All right, that's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. So um, I have been asked for a comfort break. That's why I got mixed up there. So we will take a comfort break till uh, 4.30. And if everybody can be back in your seats at 4.30, that would uh, be appreciated. That's about six minutes. And we'll take a better break a little bit later, depending on how we're moving forward. Thank you.
everybody would like to uh, join us, we will resume the meeting. Councillor Abatoye, are you with us? We'll just give her one second. There we are. Thank you very much. So we will resume the meeting. The next item that we have is indoor recreation facility planning. Uh, Diane Yanch and Sheila Gagnon uh, to present. So welcome. Ms. Shantz, I can't hear you if you're speaking. Um, she All needs right. a number to call into. She's just put a chat in. Um, Brenda or Andrew, would you mind popping up a number for her to chat to pop in so she can call in? Okay, we're good. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Cowie. All right, uh, Diane, can you hear me? Oh, not yet. It's not working for her. Uh, Mr. Fleming, did you want us to go to the next item and uh, Oh, she says, just one second. Um, sorry, Your Worship, we're just, uh, I think we can actually get her up within the next few seconds here. Um, we just sent somebody down to the second floor. She's in the building, so this shouldn't take too long. Okay, thank you. So maybe we'll just um, put our, our uh, videos down and you can let us know. Uh, everybody can just put your video down. We'll go on to uh, pause once again. And Andrew, you can let us know once uh, we have something up. You know you're in. I don't know. Can you give me a test? Hello, Diane. Diane. Hello. Do you guys have okay. me now? Yes. I'll just ask for everybody to come back online. Just give Diane. us a second, Diane. Hello. Thank you. Do you guys have me now? I've got. Yeah. Hey, Councillor Kelly, if you'd like to join us again.
Okay, there, it looks like we have everybody now. Thank you, Diane. Uh, thank you, and uh, you will be presenting the indoor recreation facility planning, so uh, go ahead. You just need to unmute, Diane. I can't. You just need to unmute, Diane. Yeah, give me where the mic is. I can hear you. If you yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you. And you're going to have to speak as close okay. as you can to your microphone, okay? Please. And you're going to have to speak yeah. as close okay. as you can. Good afternoon, Your Worship and members of council. I'm Diane Yetch, the Culture and Recreation Director, and Sheila Gagnon is with me to answer any questions. This afternoon, I will present the 2020 Indoor Recreation Facility Planning Final Report. Uh, with the addition of St. Andre Bissett High School, Taurus Field, and the Transit Park and Ride, there'll be, there was a need to analyze the Dow Centennial Center site. The analysis was to identify any upgrades and new amenities that would be beneficial to the Dow Centennial Center and what amenities would fit on the site. Then look at the Class 5 cost estimates of the amenities and the demand indicators for these amenities. On October 15, 2019, Culture and Recreation presented on the five amenities that were being explored and their Class 5 costs. This presentation will look at more of the demand indicators that were used to determine the rankings of these amenities. And it is not letting me change screen. All of the amenity ex explored will fit at the Dow Centennial Center site. With the determining the site, when determining the site layout, any existing infrastructure was explored for efficiencies. Amenities surrounding the Dow Centennial Center were considered. The traffic flow around the facility was reviewed. The amenities were fit so they would not impact current drainage. Areas for increased outdoor activities were identified and amenities placed to ensure ample parking. The addition of an aquatics facility, a community performance and rehearsal studio, and a new arena, whether community performance or event center, would change the orientation of the new build of the front entrance. The new orientation would create a dynamic and inviting entrance to all culture and recreational amenities. The new aquatics facility would be placed on the south side of the Dow Centennial Center. The proposed aquatic center is based on both the 2015 Recreation and Parks Master Plan and the question presented on the ballot during the 2017 municipal election. The facility at the Dow Centennial Center is designed for spontaneous use. The new community performance and rehearsal studio would be located on the west side of the building to capitalize on the loading dock and backstage areas of the theater. The studio can be used for both culture and recreation. On the culture side, it can be used for drama rehearsals, dance rehearsals, and is perfect for smaller 100 to 200 people performances. It creates a more intimate setting for the artist and audience. On the recreation side, it can be used as studio space for recreational classes, such as yoga, bar, Pilates, Zumba. The new arena would be, would be located on the east side of the building to take advantage of the existing arena infrastructure. The community arena provides seating for 200 spectators, similar to the current one at the Dow Centennial Center. It meets the basic needs of the residents of the community. High Performance Arena provides seating for 1,500 spectators, similar to the Jubilee Recreation Center. It could accommodate local ice users and larger sporting events and concerts. 
An event center provides seating for 3,500 to 5,000 spectators. This would be laid out in a bowl configuration and could house more significant events, including Live Nation events, as well as meet the needs of local ICE users. The report includes the Class 5 cost estimates that were presented to Council on October 15, 2019. Class 5 estimates are minus 30% to plus 50%. The Quadix is estimated at $44 million. The Community Performance and Rehearsal Studio at $6 million. And the Arenas, a Community Arena at 15, the High Performance Arena at 20, and an Event Center at 30 million. The potential amenities at the Dow Centennial Center will each complement those already existing at the facility. As not all amenities can be completed at the same time, a phased approach is required. A set of 10 demand indicators were developed by BR2 and RC strategies to help rank the amenities. These demand indicators have been used by a number of municipalities to help with the ranking of future amenities. The first criteria is general public preference. This is the indication of both current utilization and opinion of future investment focus by the general public. The metrics are three points for top general public priority to zero for a low public general public priority. The second criteria is organized user group stakeholder preference. This is the indication of both current utilization and the opinion of future investment by the organized user groups and stakeholders. The metrics are three points for strong indications of support and zero if there's no indications of support. The third criteria is the utilization of current amenities. This looks at utilization rates, household surveys, and excess demand. The metrics are three points for over 75% of the population use of the facility and or above 90% prime time demand to zero points for under 10% of the population use of the amenity and or less than 50% of prime time demand. The fourth criteria is participation trends and demographics. This is looking at local, regional, and provincial trends as well as the demographic considerations related to the amenity. The scoring metrics are three points if it responds strongly to expected demands and demographic shifts or zero for those, who do, for those that do not respond to expected trends and demographic shifts. The fifth criteria is the supply in the Edmonton metro region. It looks at the existing and planned amenities in the region. Metrics are three points for as a completely new opportunity in the region to zero points for multiple amenities already provided in the region. The sixth criteria is the supply compared to other municipalities. It is an overview of how the city compares to other municipalities in regards to the number of amenities and the population served. The metrics are three points for in, provided in other municipalities, but not in the entire region, to zero points for the amenities provided at a similar rate compared to average other municipalities. The seventh criteria is the associated cost and the financial impact of the amenity. The metrics are three points for the low overall cost impact to zero if it's not likely to be financially feasible. The next criteria is social impact of the amenity. This is the ability to have a positive change in the community and the region that addresses a pressing social challenge and cultural diversity. The scoring metrics are three for high community accessibility and makes a significant positive change to zero points for low community accessibility and low positive change. The ninth criteria is partner investment. This is the ability for the city to reduce public investment through capital and or operational sharing with partners. The metrics are three points for partnership opportunities exist to three points for no partnership opportunities. The final criteria is economic impact. This is the level of economic impact by direct injection into local and regional economy and the overall impact on the image of the city. The metrics are three points for the potential to draw reoccurring non-local spending to zero points for it does not have the potential to draw in that non-local spending. 
The potential amenities were ranked using criteria three through 10 by a team of city staff from a variety of departments in the city. The three amenities, all three amenities scored the same, 53 points. These amenities are the aquatic center, the community performance and rehearsal studio, and an event center. The community arena and high performance arena ranked lower. These rankings will have to be revised as new information becomes available. The next steps in the process are one, complete the public and stakeholder engagement, and the second is to update the capital plan. Administ administration is recommending not completing criteria one and two, the general and stakeholder preferences until the city is closer to committing, committing to a financial investment in the expansion at the DCC. The three amenities, as well as renovations at the Jubilee Recreation Center, will need to be put into revised timeline from the one that was completed in 2015. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation, Diane. I'm first on the speaking order. Uh, so the first question that I had when I looked at um, the criteria and the uh, presentation that you had. You had aquatic center, community studio, event center, community arena, and high performance arena. But what I heard you say is the event center would accommodate uh, an arena. Is that what you indicated? So the event, or through your worship, the event center is an ice arena. It just means it can be used for other things. So you could put in a concert, a rodeo, um, it just has the, it just has the capabilities of doing more, um, but it would meet the demands of our local ice users. Okay, so really, the high performance arena is the event center then. Uh, through your worship, the high performance is just a lower seating capacity of at about fifteen hundred people, where an event center would up that to about thirty five hundred to five thousand people. Okay. And I only ask that question because when you talk about uh, what I heard is you said you're going to do public engagement. Um, how do you ensure the public understands uh, exactly what these are? Because I think if you've got three that are basically the same, how are they going to understand? Uh, through your worship, I think the best way to do that is to um, showcase photos of existing amenities in other communities. That's the best way for people to get an understanding of the difference of what a community arena at a high performance and event center would be. Councillor Lennox. Thanks for your presentation, Diane. Um, so what other facilities then were considered? Uh, through your worship, uh, the main focus was what would fit on the site and the main, um, the main ones that have always come up in, in discussion and based on use were the ice, um, what we need for the uh, cultural amenity, and then also the aquatic center, which is brought up time and time again. Um, soccer was not included just because the demand is not there at this time. So when you talk, when you say that, have come up in discussions, discussions amongst um, cultural and rec services. Uh, through your worship, um, and also through the 2015 uh, rec master plan. Okay, um, it says in in the report that um, at this time, no recent relevant public engagement information is available to support scoring of these five potential amenities. Um, once public and stakeholder preferences are to be measured, the scoring could potentially, um, the ranking will be impacted. So are you prepared to go out to the public and see if there's any other facilities that they were, would want as well, or, or is, are these set in stone? Thank you, Your Worship. I don't believe these were set in stone. These were the parameters we were working with for this study. And I'm not sure if Troy has anything. Oops, Mr. Fleming. Uh, no, through your worship, I, I don't think they are set in stone. Um, we were we were doing this under the um, instruction from council to try and take a look at this so that we could start to put some numbers to propose um, expansions, um, expansion opportunities at the DC. Uh, but to do it without 
um, any public engagement. So we're, I think really we're just putting the caveat in there that with public engagement, then anything is subject to change in here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Macon. Um, so I guess when in trying to determine when to do this, will there be information that shows, like for example, to put a high performance sports arena in, you said about 1500 seats, um, is the capacity of the JRC about the same as that? And I guess what I'm getting at is, would there be a cost analysis on um, renovating the JRC to be a more effective performance arena um, and making a smaller rink at the Dow, like the cost difference between spending the, the extra 5 million and putting money into the JRC, for example? Mr. Fleming? Uh, uh, oh, Ms. Yanch can answer that question. Okay, sorry. Um, through your worship, uh, we do know what the renovation costs for the JRC are. Um, that's why it needs to be considered on when we would do a, um, another ice surface uh, and the timing of that. If we do JRC renovations or build a new rink and what the timing is, that'll be the big discussion in putting it into a capital plan. Um, the JRC is a high performance arena, so it would be, um, it would be the same seating capacity. And then when you talk about whether or not um, there's partnership opportunities, I'm just curious what would not have any sort of partnership opportunities? I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking that something could be possible with any, or so are you referring to the fact that there's none existing or there's no potential? Through your worship, we looked at what was existing right now. Um, there's always potential for new grant opportunities and partnerships to come of up. Um, recreation doesn't usually have as many partnership opportunities as some of the cultural facilities. Um, that's just a standard. Um, so they typically rank higher in, in that availability, um, but not to say they wouldn't be available, available when we went to build. Okay, um, I'm good for this round, Mayor Catcher. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Diane, for your, for your report. Um, I think this question is probably better directed at Mr. Fleming. I'm taken aback by the ranking process that appears in this report. Um, Council has been waiting many months for a capital budget priority based system for ranking. We haven't had that report. And then this shows up as a suggestion by a consultant. Um, number one, I guess, is when, when can we anticipate a discussion on the earlier motion? And number two, uh, are you satisfied with the 10 criteria here? Um, I hope not, because I'm not. So welcome that kind of discussion. Thank you. Uh, through your worship, uh I just want to be in the right context and I hope I do it right so that it doesn't it doesn't come off kind of haphazard. The, the main intent of this report was to take a long technical look at what was possible on the site and what would those amenities cost if the city were to move forward and do something. Um, from the perspective of what should the city do, that's that's a much more difficult question. It's, it's somewhat political and for it, for administration to recommend anything, we would we we don't do that based on opinion or preference. It has to be based on fact and some kind of some kind of objective um, system of measure. Or um, so there is a there is an evaluation criteria in here. Um, I've seen this done many different ways over my time, especially through recreation. There's a lot of different ways you can set up a. A criteria and you can make a lot of different results come out of them, depending on how you weight everything. Um, the main purpose for having this in here at this point in time at this early. Stage of the process is for discussion. So I'm really glad that you took the time to go through it and figure out what you liked and you didn't like, because at some point as we get down the road here and a bigger decision might get made. This is the kind of thing that we're going to need to do as a city, but. It's not the end all be all. It doesn't trump 
it doesn't trump a political decision or a, a matter of preference by the community. It's simply just administration's kind of first attempt to try to put a little bit more structure around these decisions as opposed to um, at least from administration's perspective, when we recommend something, it's got to be based on some kind of a format or a framework or something. So um, I would I would take it for what it is at this point. And then um, as like I said, as we move forward, we can refine it and we definitely do want to put it into the um, into the citywide capital budget criteria, which I believe council is having that discussion. Um, I don't think that's part of the, I'll, leave, I'll let Mr. Dance can weigh in, but I don't think it's part of the July. I think it's actually part of September when we come back and we'll talk capital. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Troy. Personally, uh, and this is Brian Kelly speaking as counselor. I kind of wish that the ranking had to been included as part of the report. It, it gives a, a misleading impression. And I do really welcome and look forward to the council discussion about the priority based capital budgeting. Uh, and with that having been said, I have no further questions on this report in its totality. I, uh, I think we shelve this until we have the other discussion and then come back and take a look at this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Abatoye. Thank you for your presentation, Diane. Um, so my first question is, um, you, had, you had talked about not going public until the city is ready to commit some money to the project. So are we talking 115 million, 44 million, 6 million? What, what exactly do we have in mind in terms of commitment from the city? I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, it, it all depends on what amenity we're looking at building and what's next in the priority. So, Mr. Fleming um, or Ms. Cowie? Through your worship, um, I think the direction is, as Troy has indicated, or Mr. Fleming has indicated, um, we wanted to see what would spit on the site and what was available as options and how we would rank them. The other thing that we need to consider is the rec, um, the recreation survey results that still have to come before council and Fort Center Park that still has to come before council um, and have that as a big picture of what, of what we're looking at and what is possible. So, and council had also directed us not to do public engagement about this because we didn't want to create a need that we couldn't fulfill. And especially given the time that we're in now and some uncertainty about our financial picture, um, it's more about site fit and estimated costs and still other pieces to come before you. So I hope Councillor Abatoya that answers your question. Yes, it does. Um, thank you. So, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of amenities and it's interesting to see that they all fit in the DCC. So obviously this is not like a one year, two year, maybe not even five year plan, right? So what do we have in mind in time of the, in terms of the timeline? Is this like a 10 years plan? Is it, what is it? I might defer to Mr. Fleming on that one, given his length of service as opposed to mine, but it is a long-term plan. It isn't, is it, it isn't a one to three to five. I think it's a long-term plan. Mr. Fleming? Yeah, and, and through your worship, there is no there is no schedule for it. I, th I think that's going to depend on a lot of factors. Um, Councillor Kelly mentioned that this has to fit into a broader discussion of all of the city's capital priorities. And then um, what I recommend strongly is that we do have that discussion and that um, the outcome of the work gets incorporated into the city's 10-year capital plan. Ten, could be maybe some of them are outside the 10-year window, but in an ideal world, we get these things in the city's 10-year capital plan somewhere at a time that we believe is appropriate. And then that way they can be uh, planned for and uh, the financial impacts can be better understood. So Thank no you. schedule right now is the short answer. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Uh, interesting report, but I think it's missing a very significant piece. It's premised on um, the uh, uh, stormwater management being um, at grade, correct? And so there's no there's no regular stormwater management pipes in the ground, take it away to a drainage course, correct? 
Uh, through your worship, the, my understanding, there's the storm pond. It, it does exist with the um, uh, uh, the storm pond is contemplated in there. There is underground storm management on the site. Um, so we, I, I believe you're correct that it does contemplate the storm system staying the way it is. Yeah, the reason I ask, ask that question is, is is that I think that if we looked at changing the stormwater management uh, protocol on that site, we actually end up with more site uh, because uh, uh, in uh, one of the plans that uh, was in the report, it showed a large green space, which would be the stormwater management facility. So going forward, I guess what I'm suggesting um, and asking the question, what would it cost to service that site recognizing that there could be other amenities. Uh, Councillor Lennox is a soccer maven. And uh, could soccer be in there if we didn't uh, have to deal with the stormwater management to take out that much green space? So that's my observation and question. I'll leave it at that. Is it something that should be looked at what the capital cost would be in relation to stormwater management? Okay. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sperling. Thanks for the presentation, Diane. Just um, just looking at uh, some of the designs and the drawings that were shared, um, not a lot of space left on the Dow site. I'm suggesting uh, it, what's been sort of forecasted here or planned here certainly builds out builds out the site. Just to maybe. Um, Another opinion on one of the facilities that was identified in the study is the um, perhaps uh, you talk about a community performance and rehearsal studio, and what's the opportunity of perhaps looking at locating that that venue in our downtown somewhere? Perhaps uh, there is existing space that we might be able to to house, and this is a really high level conversation, but. I see that as being something that would provide some, certainly some gatherings, some activity in our downtown core, and perhaps some additional space on the Dow site. Um, and I guess the conversation has to start somewhere. I mean, we had a plebiscite vote three years ago, and and uh, uh, you know, we, where do we go from here? Kind of thing. Our pool's not getting any younger. Our Dow centers paid out in, I believe, 2023 is our last adventure payment on that. So does that create some opportunity? Um, but I think that uh, I think that uh, to Brian's point, there's some there's some rationale that uh, financially perhaps we have to look at uh, to consider. Last point I want to make the question, big question too, is what impacts is is the COVID pandemic going to have on our gathering places like arenas and theaters and things like that from a design perspective is there, are we going to have challenges in the future if we moved ahead with something today so just my thoughts thank you okay. and i did hear some questions so i'm not sure mr fleming if you can answer those <laughs> or Ms. Okay, worship i i took them as rhetor as sort of statements but if there is a question in there Councillor sperling wants to send it back i'd be happy to one in particular i guess the hot the hottest one i had but related to the uh, performance center the uh, rehearsal studio that was planned for the site as an addition to the site perhaps considering that uh downtown versus on the uh, dow site yeah and it, that certainly could be considered wasn't part of the scope of this work and and it's probably part of uh i'd say more of a bit of a higher level conversation for council, but uh, certainly could be considered. Thank um, you. Through your worship, we did we did look at um, the efficiencies of putting the block the black box or the community performance and rehearsal studio at the DCC would have. Um, that way you could share staff and share the infrastructure that's there using the same lobby, the same backstage, um, those kind of things. Um, so that's why it was uh, initially thought to put there. It would also help with dance festivals um, that we have to get people out of soccer fields and into proper dance spaces. Um, so then the soccer field could be used for what its main purpose was. Um, so that was the, the biggest reason for its location. Okay, thank you. Um, so just uh, before we leave this one, just confirm next steps on this. 
uh, through your worship, the next steps would be um, or our recommendation would be to take this report and the numbers within, and then that can kind of move to the uh, the capital budget discussion and the, the 10 year capital plan. Okay, and I'm not seeing uh, any motions required at this point in time. Okay, so we'll move on. Thank you very much, uh, Diane and uh, Ms. Cowie, for your uh, information on this one. We'll move on to the next one, local transit service level extension. Uh, Anthony Leonisi. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. Uh, so good afternoon or good evening, um, Your Worship and Council. My name is Anthony Dionigi, Transit Supervisor. I'm here today to present Council with an option to extend the existing transit service level reduction as a result of the current COVID-19 pandemic. So on April 1st, uh, 2020, Council temporarily adjusted local transit service levels by reducing uh, weekday local services and adding Saturday uh, services in addition. And this was originally to be implemented from April 14th till June 28th. This was a reduction in local service hours from 132 to 98 hours per week. Uh, today, administration is recommending that council support the motion as presented today to extend the local service level reduction previously approved by council until further notice. This decision is due to ridership decreases being experienced on the service due to the impact of COVID-19. Administration will continue to monitor, monitor the service as it is anticipated ridership may increase during the continued um, provincial relaunch strategy. Um, and administration will continue to ensure compliance with Alberta Health Services guidelines. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lennox, you're first in the speaking order. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I think this was something that came up the last time was that um, I have a concern about the no end date. Um, I think if I remember right, that we talked about that the last time this came forward and wanted an end date just so that we could, I guess, kind of be updated and in the loop as to where where the ridership was. Um, are you opposed to an end date? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Lennox. Uh, no, I'm not opposed to an end date. Um, I believe we're coming back to Council on August 25th to um, present um, our recommendation for fall, whether or not we want to continue with the, the current service level reduction or reinstate our previous service level for September, because September is usually when we have a, you know, higher ridership uh, time. But I'm certainly open to, to placing a, a deadline if, if, uh, if the city manager is okay with that. I did, yes, through your worship, um, we could, if you did want to go until August 31st, that would actually work out with the timing of us coming back on August 25th. So that would be a, another alternative. So to put the end date as August 31st? Uh, through your worship, that's correct. Okay, I have no other questions, thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Macon. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Anthony. Uh, I had the exact same comment as Councillor Lennox. Um, I just like having those check-in points of count with council when we're doing, when we're adjusting service levels. So um, if the person scheduled to put the motion forward were to adjust it to August 31st, I would uh, support that as well. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you, uh, Anthony. Thank you for report. And um, as an aside note, or a side note, thank you as well for responding to my emails over the course of the last week. I appreciate the information. Just for public clarity, at the current level of service for the commuter system because we've i think we took away or cancelled three three routes um or three hours worth of delivery a, a while ago but at the current level of service what's the monthly cost that the city is out of pocket after recovery of transit fares for as we sit here right now for estimated or average cost to the city for april may and i expect june some sort of estimate, please. I wish to Councillor Kelly. I, I don't have that estimate on hand at the moment, but uh, I can certainly take that away and provide it with for you. Okay, then 
try another question. Sure. What's the monthly check that the City of Fort Saskatchewan currently writes to the City of Edmonton for provision of this service? Um, sorry, I would just need a second to pull that up. I have a lot of uh, stats open, but it's mostly related to local transit service. I can, um, do you want to see, do you want to know what the last month's invoice was? Uh, sure, that's May. Uh, that's after we did the reduction in service level, yes. Just one second. So that was uh, $47,100. That's, that's good enough. Thank you. $47,000 for the month of May. Um, there's been a... I have to preface my comment, Madam Mayor, so please let me. When I speak about transit and the costs, I'm always have this suspicion that it sounds like I'm negative on transit and I'm not. I am though very positive, very adamant that our city spend the money for the greatest good, for the greatest number of people over the long haul. So that means we try to spread our resources as best we can and, 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 and help as many people as we can. Okay, With Councillor COVID, Kelly, do you have a question? I because asked for we some, don't have a motion. Motion. I asked yet. for some. I asked for some liberty before I made that comment. And yes, I have a question. Thank you. Um, so, Anthony, the ridership in your chart for the month of May shows approximately. I'm judging 600, 650 um, trips. Is that the correct term? Yes, that's correct. So, a trip is a one-way access and egress from the bus? Uh, through your worship to Council Kelly, yeah, a trip is every time a passenger enters a bus. Thank you. So when we're talking commuter, each person to Edmonton would normally be expected to return to Fort Saskatchewan. So one trip is one, two trips is one person, one rider. Uh, through your worship, that's correct. So when we do 500 or 600 trips, that's really 300 riders um, over a 21 day period. We're looking at 15 riders per day. At a, so we get 15 people to Edmonton per day for one month for a $47,000 cost. No offense to anybody. I'd like to suggest this council consider reducing the service, to, service um, level further. I think that um, those costs do not are not justified by the uptake and the use of the service. And I would be content to leave that a change to August 31 and revisit it for the fall, but to cut it back even further for the summertime and long ways to get to my point, Anthony. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Abatoye. Thank you for your presentation, Anthony. Um, so you'd mentioned in your in the um, agenda that the ridership reduced in um, April and May by about six or something percent. So I'm just curious, with things um, slowly opening back, um, what 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 do you think the estimated numbers are going to drop for in June? Um, drop yeah, for sure. Uh, so through your worship, uh, for June, um, I'm estimating that it's going to be roughly around a 50 to 55 percent reduction so we are seeing a, a bit of an increase now okay with uh, people starting to get outside more okay okay great um okay thank you i'll leave you at that so i'll leave my comments to when the motion comes forward thank you Anthony. sure thank you councillor harris um so anthony um have people come to in our community with perhaps not their own transportation have they come to expect uh, that a commuter service is, is an efficient way for them to get into the community or into the city of Edmonton? Is that ultimately what the rationale is for providing the commuter service? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Harris, yes, I would agree with that. Um, it's also an option for folks who, who don't drive, which is, um, you know, it is, a, it is a large segment of our population, I would, well, I would argue, um, especially for those who are younger and older. Um, okay, so so it's a quality of life service that people that can't otherwise get around, it gives them a viable option. That's why we're providing it, correct? Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, thanks. 
Okay. Councillor Sperling. Thanks for the presentation, uh, Anthony. So we're talking local transit service here, um, which is in addition, of course, to our contracted service that we have through the city of Edmonton. Uh, through your worship, yes, that's correct. Okay, so so how does this local transit service that we have right now mesh with the city of Edmonton uh, contract that we have? So city of Edmonton right now picks up at the Dow Center and our yes. local service gathers riders to be delivered to the Dow Center and then they commute to Edmonton from there through the city of Edmonton transit. Uh, through your worship, yes, that's correct. Uh, the local uh, can act like a feeder service for the commuter. Right. Um, they so can what's people around town and yeah. If we're looking at reducing the service even for what's the impact to to the existing arrangement with the city of Edmonton? Um, through your worship, um, it would just require a contract amendment. Um, the way that city of Edmonton does scheduling is 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 quarterly, so it would have to sort of align up well with that. Um, so the last sign up that we implemented the the last service reduction for was um, was June, and I believe the next one would be four months later, so uh, October, I believe. So do we have in terms of the cost of the contract with the city of Edmonton? Is that a flat monthly cost, or is that is that a fluctuating cost? Uh, through your worship, it's based on the uh, schedule that we draw up for them. So they have to do some back end calculations based on, uh, you know, driver scheduling, how much time the bus is is deadheading. So that's time when it's not collecting revenue. Right. And uh, other stuff like fuel and and those kinds of things. So it's not like a it's not a set hourly rate like our local. It's more based on uh, Edmonton operations. So if we look at a reduction in our local service, does that would that reduce the cost of our Edmonton service? Um, through worship, no, the, the two are are separate. Totally separate. Okay. Yeah. And just to confirm, uh, in your in the presentation here, we would be continuing with the Saturday local service to Edmonton. Correct? Uh, through, through worship, no, that's uh, Saturday for for in town only. Saturday in town only. Okay, thank yeah. you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm next on the speaking order. So this is just basically saying leave it uh, where it's at at this point in time. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Your Worship. That's correct. Okay. Um, so with the COVID-19, um, I understand that's probably impacted a great deal of people. Um, so what's going to be our measurement as we, we go forward? Because I mean, uh, I'm not sure how many people, you know, are are still going downtown or working from home. You know, just what do we anticipate? Because I know things are opening up more, but um, do you hear anything from the riders? Um, Your Worship, uh, for for trips going downtown, one the largest impact right now will be um, U Pass. So. Uh, with the post-secondary institutions not are continuing to do virtual courses in September, um, that that will impact you know a, a somewhere in the range of thirty percent of our our ridership. Um, but we are continuing to monitor the situation on a weekly basis, and hopefully, uh, we'll have something more, um, I guess, more solid to provide council at the end of August when we when we when we return. Okay, and I guess the last question that I have is, I, I know before when we were implementing transit, it was always the question that um, people needed to feel confident transit would be there for them. And when we keep changing things, they lose their confidence. So um, I, I guess that's the other question that I have is, do you feel we'll lose confidence with our riders if we keep changing things? Your, uh, to your worship, yes, uh, that's definitely um, a factor, uh, especially when you want to gain uh, trust and and um, make, making sure that the system feels reliable is is knowing that every time you go on the bus that the schedule is not going to change uh, frequently because a lot of times, as much as we communicate to riders, there are sometimes gaps 
uh, information gaps. So we want to make sure that they can depend on the service. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go to the motion and then we can have more discussion and debate through that. Councillor Lennox, you're uh, next to put a motion on. Did you wish to put it on? Yeah, I'll put it on. Um, I'll make the motion that council will extend the current reduced local transit service levels um, and to be reviewed August 31st, 2020. Okay, thank you. Do you wish to speak to the motion? Um, I will. I think that um, I appreciate Councillor Kelly's comments. Um, and, but I also think that where we're at kind of as a society, um, things are starting to open up a little bit. Um, people are maybe taking more risks than they, they were a month ago. Um, and I do think that uh, there's been more people that have been going back to work. I would like to see uh, this level of service continue. I think we need to give it um, a little bit more time before we make any any more decisions on on cutting anything back. So those would be my comments. Okay, thank you. The motion is being put forward, accepted, and spoken in favor of. Councillor Macon, you're next. Uh, I'll support the motion. The emotion. I'll support the motion, and I don't have any further comments. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kelly. On the motion. Yes, thank you. For the month of May, on average, 14 people commuted to Edmonton from the city of Fort Saskatchewan per day. 14 people per day. The check we wrote to the city were, to the city of Edmonton was $47,000 for those 14 people. And no offense to anybody, including those 14 people. We offer the service. I wish this 50 people used it per day. But the fact is, 14 people used it per day. Um, we're at, a, at a service delivery level of 14 people per day, it works out to a city of Edmonton cost of $3,340 to get each of those 14 people per day to Edmonton for 21 days in a month. Uh, back to the greatest good for the greatest number, I'm not convinced that for the remaining months of the summer that that is in any way a good use of financial resources. So having said that, I have an amending motion and the amending motion will be to I don't see the motion, hang on, sorry. The current, pardon me, the amending motion is that council add, reduce further the local transit service by an additional two trips per day until August 31st. Point of order. I'm going to ask if that's really an amending motion or if that's a completely separate motion because it changes the whole context of the original motion. You are absolutely correct and I meant to. So, uh, okay, I'll leave it at that. I'm done. Thank you. Made my point. Okay, just for clarity, so you're not putting an amended motion on? The amending motion, listen, um, Madam Mayor, I have a point of order in between. I'm just trying to. I think Councillor Lennox is, is right. I'm trying to 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 increase or decrease further the level of service, and that is not the motion in front of us. So I just want to make clear that Council understands what they're voting for. Cost okay. the City of Port Saskatchewan thirty-two hundred dollars. That's after transit fare recovery per month to get fourteen people. Each of those people into Edmonton. I think that's a waste of money at this particular juncture in our life. Thank you. Thank you. I was just asking for clarity. So there is no amending motion. Thank you. Um, all right, and you're finished. Uh, Councillor Avatoye on the motion. Yeah, I'll support the motion. And I do not believe that um, providing a service that provides a better quality of life to our residents is a waste of money. 
And as we heard from um, Mr. Dioniji, he said that it's, it's mostly the younger people and the older people that are using this transit. They are the most vulnerable in our community. And I believe that they need it. And it's been also said here that we're going to revisit this issue in the fall. So I don't believe that we should be reducing any services. We know for certain that transit is a community service, a social service that we cannot ever fully um, recover our costs. So it's a service that the city has to provide for people. Um, so I'll support the motion as it sits till August 31st, and I look forward to bring it to having this conversation again in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Um, interesting discussion. Um, fiscal prudence is really important uh, to our job as elected officials. I get that. But we've taken on to provide a service that is a socially provided service, and it's a business related service, and it's a quality of life. It's many different things because we don't have everybody in our community that's exactly the same. There are people that use it to get to work and they can certainly probably afford to drive, but that's a whole nother story. Um, I can't see any uh, ability to make the change in the short term. In the long term, I think we, outside of this whole COVID thing, um, I think it's always prudent for us to look at how best to provide that service. And I think we have appropriate resources in house um, that can do the analysis to bring forward recommendations on routing and scheduling that ultimately help us reach the, the broadest number. What I would say in relation to cutbacks that were uh, being proposed or considered or contemplated by Councillor Kelly, well, th those may make sense from a financial perspective. I think um, we have to always be prudent of how it impacts our community. and. Uh, and, and I honestly believe that uh, now is not the time to make that change, but certainly at some future time, uh, we definitely can un undertake that analysis. But I will support the motion. Um, it is time specific in that regard. I thank Councillor Lennox for uh, identifying that timeline. It gives us a sense of, uh, of certainty in that regard. And then ultimately, I think uh, we're sending some good uh, good messages to our to our administration to be be cognizant of cost structure. Um, so those are my feelings. Uh, I, there, are, there are so many people that I think we've all talked to that have said this is an important service. And if we didn't have COVID, they'd be using the service. If we impact it negatively, we will impact people's uh, perception of reliability of the service, which will ultimately not build ridership, which we need to build over the long term. So those are my thoughts. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sperling. Thank you again, Anthony. Just a couple of thoughts really quick on the motion. Um, you know, we are part of the Metro region. We are, we are connected in many ways to the city of Edmonton. Transit's important to help uh, move our residents of our community in and out of the city for various reasons. Um, at this point, I'm not ready, given the impacts of, of COVID and the and the reduction we've seen, I'm not quite ready to reduce our transit service any further. And I think we're in a bit of a recovery pattern. I'm not sure how long that will take, but I suspect our numbers will start to climb and that um, August 25th isn't that far out. We're just a couple of months out on that. So uh, I'm willing to uh, to uh, maintain the existing service to uh, to that date, and we'll see where we're at at that time. But I will support the motion. Okay, thank you. And for myself, I'll support the motion as well. Um, I do believe, though, that we do have to provide our riders confidence that uh, if it if if the bus is going to be there, it will be there. Because failure to do that just means that you know what they're going to say. Well you know what, I've got to find a ride or, um, you know, potentially some people may have to go on employment because they can't get into the city. I mean, with our students, we don't know what's happening, but we're saying, you know, we want to ensure that we have ridership for them when, when this all starts up. So, you know, it's, I know it's a long haul and I know transit's uh, um, always a hard one, but Councillor Abatoy is completely right. It's our most vulnerable people who are the ones who utilize it probably the most. And we had Robin Hood Association come in and talk and say to us, you know what, we need the bus. And they asked for it 
to even have more more hour, hours available. So I very much support, uh, I hate having to leave it at where we're at right now, but I do have faith in administration that you're monitoring what's going on and you'll bring rock recommendations as you see uh, things are changing and evolving. So, you know, we have to rely on administrations um, uh, to, to be analyzing this constantly. So I do support the motion. Um, Councillor Lennox, you're next. Did you wish to close or is anybody okay? No, um, I'm seeing another round coming up. Did you have any more? Uh, no, I'll, save Lennox? My, I'll save my comments for close. Okay, thank you. Councillor Macon, anything further? Um, no, I think this motion is about our local transit service. And to that end, I think that this is a good motion and I will continue to support it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kelly. Uh, yes, thank you. I listened carefully to my fellow councillors' comments in the la after I last spoke, and I appreciate them. Uh, the value of the service is not to be underestimated. That's not what I'm trying to get at. Uh, economics is important because the dollars we spend on transit come from somebody's pocket. And those dollars could also be spent someplace else. So we must always be cognizant of what it costs per person out of the city's pocket to support a particular service level. I'm happy with leaving it until August 31, but I would point out to my fellow councillors, the use of transit has been diminishing despite our best efforts for the last couple of years at least. I will point out to my fellow councillors that this is also consistent with the articles that I, I read in the Edmonton media about, about the use of their transit system. Despite spending hundreds of millions a year, their ridership has been diminishing as well. It might be an economic reality. It just might be a reflection on the economy in, in the province of Alberta. It doesn't matter what the cause is, as business people, as 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 councillors with a fiduciary responsibility to our other stakeholders in the community, it behooves us to spend everybody's money wisely. So I, I look forward to the discussion at the end of August. I would like to, to suggest that at that time, we perhaps come prepared to talk about service levels in general when it comes to transit, what sort of notice we would be comfortable with giving transit users if in fact we saw we needed to make a service level reduction because obviously that can't happen because one councillor speaks up at a council meeting, it does affect people, proper notice has to be given. I'd like to have a discussion around those sorts of things. I'd like also for administration to, to make a recommendation to council, if at all possible, on what they perceive to be a minimum per hour usage for the commuter transit system before we cut that hour out. And it's not the end of the world if we cut an hour out midday. That just means that the user has to alter their desire to travel midday around the available transit. So if I need to book a doctor's appointment, worst case scenario, or if I simply need to go shopping midday into Edmonton, I can work my life or set my appointment around my available transportation. That's the points I'm trying to make. So, so I, uh, I'll continue to talk costs. Those are important. Uh, and I look forward to the discussion coming in the end of August and hopefully we'll have some more data and, and perhaps take a look at, at, at rationalizing the commuter service. I suspect that when we get into September, we're gonna find that we're operating at about half of what we did last year. And that's my optimistic projection, but I look forward to being wrong. Um, thank you, everybody. We'll uh, move forward with the vote as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Anything further? Um, you know what, I think I'm good. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harris. I think we've covered this one pretty well. Um, I support the motion and we'll be voting in the affirmative. Thank you. Councillor Sperling, anything further? Uh, nothing further, and I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lennox on close. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, 
I agree I, with Councillor Kelly. I think cost is important. I don't think that um, we should ever blindly provide a service without ever considering um, the cost to the rest of the residents in this community because we serve them as well. Um, I do think that it's going to be an interesting conversation at the end of August because with uh, university and college classes still being online in September, um, I can only anticipate that the usage of transit will be well below um, what it has been. So, and I think that we're going to have to have those difficult discussions. So, um, yeah, those those are my thoughts. Thanks. That is carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, next item that we have is interim report, April 2020. I believe this is Clayton Northey um, providing the presentation. Are you Good. with us, Clayton? I, I, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm just going to get the this up on the screen. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, your worship members council. Um, this, uh, this evening I'm presenting the uh, April uh, 2020 interim report. Um, the COVID-19 has um, pandemic has had a significant impact on the city's results for the first four months of 2020, affecting nearly all municipal operations and resulting in facility closures, modifications to existing service levels, staff reductions, et cetera. The impact of COVID-19 and the resulting economic fallout is expected to continue to be a significant factor uh, for the city for the remainder of 2020 and beyond. Um, the forecast for 2020, uh, for 2020 presented in the April 20, uh, in this report, assumes that the resumption of normal services, service levels begins in September 2020. Um, subsequent to this report, the city has, um, actually the province has uh, moved into phase two of its relaunch plan, and the city has begun to reopen some facilities and restart some programs. However, the significant uh, uncertainty remains regarding demand and ultimately revenues that will be generated from these resumed services. Furthermore, the current economic uncertainty has increased the risk that a significant portion of the city's property taxes will be uncollected at the end of the year. Subsequent to this report, unemployment rate um, Unemployment has risen um, to 15.5% in May in Alberta, um, compared to 13.4 as calculated in April. Um, also a significant portion of small and medium sized businesses are expected to close their doors permanently over the next several months, according to uh, various um, um, economic bodies, the uh, chamber, et cetera. The city has a number of, has taken a number of steps to mitigate these financial risks, including minimizing spending, curtailing some services, and acquiring access to credit facilities. In the first four months of 2020, the city had a net operating budget deficit of $478,000. The city is expected and is based on this forecast that was presented in April, the city is uh, forecasting a $1.4 million surplus for 2020 before any allowance for uncollectible property taxes. Operating expense uh, revenues for the period were approximately $322,000 lower than budget and are expected to be um, potentially $2.74 million lower than budget for the year. Um, this is primarily led by user fees and charges, which have dropped uh, 
by 486,000 below budget year to date and expected to be 2.495 million below budget for the for the year. This is primarily the result of cult, uh, various culture and recreation facility closures, as well as things like uh, transit, um, uh, the fee deferral, um, at the lower planning, uh, permitting costs, etc. Um, investment revenue is expected to be uh, $493,000 below budget for 2020, primarily due to the Bank of Canada cutting its target interest rate by 1.5% in March. Operating expenses were $815,000 below budget in the first four months of 2020, and that are expected to be uh, $4.8 million below budget for the year. Um, salaries, wages, and benefits um, are the largest chunk of this at $373,000 below budget year to date, and $1.3 million below budget for the forecast for the year. The city has deferred uh, filling vacant positions, reduced staff hours, restricted the use of casual and temporary labor. Culture and recreation services represents the largest portion of these surpluses at $220,000 year to date and 1.4 forecast for the year um, due to their facility closures. In order to mitigate or, or minimize some of the staff layoff, uh, the need for staff layoffs, the city has redeployed a number of staff from closed business units to parks and other business units that are still operating. Um, a number of projects have been scaled back, deferred or canceled in 2020. Some of these include spending reductions to Vision Zero, um, special program events programming deferral for uh, firefighter annual medical assessments and implementation of the cultural master plan. Uh, as well, uh, cancellation of fitness instructor classes, seniors, and youth events have um, all contributed to lower expenditures. Um, the city is also reducing spending in areas such as materials and supplies, training and development, advertising uh, across the board with uh, its expenditures in order to reduce all non-essential spending wherever possible. Um, and has deferred various preventative maintenance programs. In addition to this, in the first in the first four months of the year, we recognize the city recognized the um, annexation payment of uh, five hundred forty one thousand dollars. That's exp um, uh, that's due to Strathcona County at the end of this month. Um, however, that's expected to be offset by a capital contribution to the Point of Pins. A road winding project from the county. With respect to the 2020 capital program, um, the 2020 capital program consists of 13 new projects as well as 30, 30 multi year projects that were carried forward from 2019. At April 30th, one of those projects had been completed, uh, while 34 were in progress or ongoing and seven were on hold for various reasons. Um, these numbers have been adjusted to reflect the changes at the last council meeting um, regarding funding projects from MSI. Um, the city is has spent $2.8 million a year to date um, on capital expenditures and is expected to spend $25.5 million to complete existing projects. Uh, more information, uh, as always, is available on these each project in Appendix 3 of the, the interim report. Financial position. The city's um, net financial assets decreased by $12.8 million uh, in the first four months. Um, I do want to note that it was actually, for the first time in a number of years, um, in a net financial asset position, so there was no net debt um at the end of april um that's the result of a number of years of contributions to uh reserves um and other cost cut and cost various cost cutting measures um uh, the major major drive in our uh, decrease on net financial assets is a 13.3 million dollar decrease in cash and cash equivalents um there was a reduction in long-term debt of 0.5 million, 
Um, and the city is currently at 29% of its debt limit and 20% of its debt service limit. Um, at April 30th, um, the city was had $752,000 in outstanding property taxes, which is comparable uh, to April 30th of 2019 and um, low, and approximately $400,000 lower than at December 31st, 2019. However, um, in response to COVID-19, the city has deferred um, application of property tax penalties uh, facing uh, for to assist taxpayers facing financial hardship due to the pandemic um, uh, and excluding uh, designated industrial properties, uh, July 1st penalties July, August, or August 1st penalties and September 1st penalties have all been deferred to October, November, and December, respectively. Um, this city is expecting the collection of 2020 property tax will be slower than in previous years, and we are seeing that year to date. Um, the city is also anticipating that business closures and rising unemployment will impact our ability to collect 2020 property taxes in 2020. Um, some preliminary modeling that the city has done um, has indicated that uh, un uncollected taxes at December 31st could be between 3.95 million and 12.8 million um, outstanding compared to again 1.1 million at the end of December 2019. In order to mitigate that credit, uh, the, that credit and liquidity risk, um, the council has adopted um, the line of credit borne by law, which authorized the city to borrow up to twenty million to finance ongoing operations for the city. To date, the city has not made any borrowings pursuant to that bylaw. The city, um, the city's financial reserves uh, at the end of April. Or sorry, forecast uh, uncommitted financial reserves based on April 20, uh, 2020 results is 42.0 million, including 36.8 million in internally restricted reserves and 5 million in externally restricted reserves. The city's optimal balance for op internally restricted reserves is 35.5, so slightly lower than our um, actual forecast. Stabilization based as a result of the changes it to the um, to the funding for a number of projects to MSI funding uh, at the last council meeting stabilization and contingency reserves and capital project reserves are now fully fought are now fully funded at 3.8 million and 2.5 million dollars respectively above their optimal balances um, however the infrastructure life cycle maintenance and replacement reserves are remain um, $8.4 million un underfunded. Um, that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Clayton. Uh, Councillor Macon, you're first. Thanks for your presentation, Clayton. Um, I will start off with a couple questions. So let's say that the city keeps tracking towards a $12.8 million outstanding uh, property taxes. If we, if we kind of go with the worst case scenario though, when would the city need to make a draw off of our um, plan of credit that we established? Um, at this point, um, we believe that we have sufficient capital available uh, to us um, until about November, uh, approximately, um, with some uncertainty. And then, um, I don't know if you can answer this or if perhaps Mr. Fleming, but I'm just curious if we've heard much from the chamber about how Fort Saskatchewan business is doing. You make, um, you refer to there being some economists talking about business closures and and uh, how that can be affected. But um, do we have any idea how Fort Saskatchewan is looking on that front? Uh, 
I'm, I apologize. I don't have an answer to that question. And to your worship, I would just say we're we're probably still too early to make to make to say anything definitive around that. There's still a number of federal programs that are um, kind of floating both homeowners and businesses in a sense, and and um, it's that's the kind of thing we need to wait until later in the year before we can make a really true assessment. Are you good, Councillor Macon? I think I'm unmuting and remuting in the wrong direction. I'm good for now. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Uh, yes. Thank you, Clayton. I'm just trying to, to wrap my head around the, the reserve slash capital savings balance of the city and where it might be come December, for instance, or November. You made reference to to overfunded reserves, but my recollection was we also boosted our capital spending or accelerated our capital spending to use up those reserves in the current calendar year. I, so is that a is that correct? Number one, um, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, um, when we we did increase spending, however, we uh, overall, however, more so, we actually reallocated funding that was was originally intended to be funded from existing capital projects or some either from exit from reserve funds to be funded from um, the MSI fund um, there, there but there was so both actually happened roughly and very approximate can you tell me what the actual non-MSI increase in capital spending was approved and if you don't um, if, if you can't that's fine through your worship I don't have that that information in front of me okay thank you uh I'm good for now I'll, I'll continue to to mull this over thank you Clayton thank you Councillor Abatoye thank you for your presentation Clayton um, so I'm just curious to, to know with the um, utility and property tax deferral that the city provided to residents, how has that impacted our finances as a city? Through, through your worship to Councillor Abatoya, the, um, it's very early to say, to speak to that in, based on the findings in this report. Um, subsequent to that period, um, we are seeing um, relatively little impact to our utility uh, payments. However, we are seeing um, a significant um, difference between um, where we were at this point this year, um, today, this year, compared to a year ago. However, we, the, we aren't 100% certain that that is indicative of where we're going to be yet because we haven't done this type of analysis on a daily basis before um, and we haven't looked back further than one year um, we should have a better sense of that um, after june 30th and we should i may we will update council on that okay thank you um so my second question is um is more like a yes or no question um so so you had mentioned that obviously there's been a decline in revenue but it's also been a corresponding decrease in expenses so so that obviously has a nil effect to our bottom line right so we're not in deficit we actually we actually have a surplus so we shouldn't okay i'm going to keep my next question actually to what to the, to the boring part so just stay tuned <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. You're good, Councillor Harris. You know, I always look forward to these reports. Um, I've seen a lot of financial reports over, over the years in municipal government, and I think our staff do a really good job of pulling together the data. Uh, it presents a good uh, synopsis, and so on that basis, I really don't have any questions. Um, there's so many things that are swirling around. We could ask questions for the next half an hour, an hour or two, but at this point, I'm happy with the information we got in front of us. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sperling. Thanks for the presentation, Clayton. Just um, 
just on page 89, it talks about um, uncollected property taxes and the fact that, of course, that we, re we deferred them uh, till later in the year. As a result of that deferral, does the penalty to the uh, tax payer increase because of that deferral or does it remain the same? Um, through your worship to Councillor Sperling, the penalty that would have been applied in July, I hope I answered this correctly, um, the penalty that would previously have been applied on July 1st uh, will now be applied on October 1st, so it'll be a 3% penalty. Um, it will be an, there's no interest charged on unpaid property taxes, it's strictly a penalty. And same, same with August and September, they've just shifted the date of the penalties. If that makes right. sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. I wasn't clear if the calculation changed. Um, that's all I have at the moment. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so at the beginning of your uh, uh, presentation, you talked about a $1.2 million surplus. Where did you get that from? Uh, through your worship, I'm oh, sorry, through your worship, um, the, uh, it's actually a $1.4 million surplus is the, in the forecast right now. However, I want to, again, caution that that is before we will have to do an allowance this year for uncollectible property taxes, which has not been reflected in this, this forecast yet. Okay, and my next question comes to, so we come to the end of the year and um, if, if we haven't collected enough, I mean, we can't have a deficit and we, and we have to do our borrowing, uh, do a borrowing uh, on, our, on our credit line. So can you explain what the process is, how we make that up the following year? Um, through your worship, oh, sorry, to your worship. <laughs> Um, it's me. The, um, the step, first step is that we actually can run a deficit and um, you cannot, council cannot budget a deficit under Alberta law. Um, however, you can actually run a deficit as we saw, I believe, la the year before last. Um, that said, we, if we get to a point where we feel like we need to draw down on the line of credit, um, we will we will contact the, uh, the the institution, the financial institution, to uh, pull funds um, that will be shown as a proceeds from uh, debenture from a line of credit or borrowing, um, and we will inform council um, of that borrowing um, as soon as is practicable. Um, we will again, I believe, we're, in addition to our quarterly report triannual reporting, we are also providing monthly updates um, to council and to uh, administration, so the, uh, to the city manager to make sure that we stay on top of this and we don't get caught off guard. Um, and we are working on modeling out the cash flow scenario so that we don't run into a situation where we have, uh, where we aren't able to pay our bills because we don't have enough cash. Well, that's our biggest risk at this point. Okay. I'm going to let it go for that. Councillor Lennox. Thanks for your presentation, Clayton. I just have a, a question. Um, I'm just looking at the solid waste um, numbers and there's quite an increase in, in the garbage and the organics. I'm just wondering, does that translate into um, more money spent by the city on that? Um, that uh, through your worship to Councillor Lennox, um, absolutely, it, uh, we do pay uh, part of the charge for um, curbside collection is um, a per ton uh, charge. Um, that said, we aren't seeing a, we aren't forecasting a, a deficit on solid waste at this point in time. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to go through quickly one more time, see if anybody has anything else. Uh, Councillor Macon, anything further? Uh, no, my other comments were addressed. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Kelly? Uh, yes, thank you. Clayton, just for clarity for those that might be watching tonight, there is a distinct difference between cash flow 
and profit or surplus and deficit, operating surplus or deficit. And I think this gets back to Mayor Catcher's question. I wonder if you could spend a bit more time just detailing that. So, so for instance, if we don't collect any property taxes, they still sit on a balance sheet as a receivable. Where you don't, that doesn't create a deficit. What that does do, or what that does mean, is that we have no longer any money in the bank. It's all of our assets have been converted from cash to account receivable. Is that correct? Uh, through your worship, that's correct. In its simplest form. In its simplest form. Yeah. So, so it's possible to have an operating surplus. In fact, it happens in business every year, and yet still have to draw on an, on an operating line of credit. Uh, through your worship, that's absolutely true. Perfect. Thank you. Councillor Abatoy, anything further? No, you're good. Okay. Councillor Harris, anything further? No, I'm fine. This is a good discussion, good information. Thanks a lot. Okay. Councillor Sperling, anything further? Just a quick question for Clayton again. Um, you have your line of credit for $20 million set up through an FI right now, correct? Uh, through your worship, that's correct. We do have uh, the 20 million set up at this moment. Just uh, just wondering, do you have to give notice to draw that down or can you just write a check and draw it down? Uh, through, through your worship, we do have to give, I believe it's 24 hours notice, but not more than that. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, I'm good. Councillor Lennox, anything further? I'm good, thanks. Okay, so I think uh, we have covered this one off. So thank you very much for your presentation, Clayton. Uh, I'm not sure about everybody else, but uh, I need a comfort break. So um, um, I'm gonna look, do you want a 10 minute comfort break? Give me a show of heads, nods. Okay, uh, to our moderator, we'll take a 10 minute comfort break back in our seats at 610. Thank you.
Okay, if I can have everybody join us, it's uh, 610. Councillor Macon, are you there? And Mr. Fleming? Your Worship, Councillor Macon seems to have lost her connection, so she'll just need to get reconnected. Okay, just put us back into recess for just a moment then. Oh, okay, there she is, okay. Great, so if everybody wants to come on then. So perhaps Mr. Fleming, um, I don't know if there's some additional training we can use. I don't know if we can actually lock people on our screens because I find for me, everybody flips around, moves around, and I'm constantly looking around. Something you can ask our moderator for our next meeting. So I find I'm chasing people on the screen. Uh, okay, so the uh, we will resume. And the next item is Regional Transit Services Commission interim appointment. Mr. Fleming presenting. And thank you, Worship. I'm just going to do a quick verbal on this one. Uh, the intention of this report is that council appoint a member um, appoint a member of council to the RTSC interim board, and then in addition, that council appoints an alternate member to the uh, um, interim board as well. So, the progression with the transit process so far has been that there was a transition team uh, that was in place that was working to figure out kind of where this was going to go. The transition team turns into the interim board, which is the, the point that we're at now. And then if the commission does become stood up and we are a member of it, we would be back in front of council again to have council approve the, uh, the permanent uh, member of the board. And um, so with that, um, I did get some feedback from council that uh, the motion, the way the motion was worded originally, it's a little bit presumptuous. It actually has the name of a member of council in there. so. Uh, that feedback is well taken, and uh, and uh, from there I'll just take any questions or comments if there are any. Okay, thank you, Councillor Macon. You're first. Um, I guess. Um, sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback right now. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I support Councillor Harris being on the. Sorry, I can, I'm having a lot of trouble right now with the feedback. Can we just come back to me, I think? Okay, possibly, Mr. Fleming, you're going to have to mute while somebody else is speaking. I'm not seeing anybody else open, so uh, just, yeah, just mute until we come back to you or a question, okay? Um, try that again, Councillor Macon, and see if you still get the feed, feedback. Okay. Um, it's myself, I can hear myself as soon as I talk. So I will try to get through it. Um, I support Councillor Harris being on there again, if you would like to be, um, or to hear from anyone else who wants to be on there, that's fine. I would also put my name forward as the alternate if we were looking for someone. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, we don't have a motion yet, so it's got questions. Uh, Councillor Kelly? No questions, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Abatoye? No questions. I'm, I'm okay with Councillor Harris being on the board, on the committee. Thank you. Councillor Harris? No, I think this is just moving it to the next <laughs> stage, and it is only for a period of time. So uh, uh, I'll leave it to council to make the decision. 
Councillor Sperling, any questions? No questions. I do support Councillor Harris uh, maintaining his role in the Capital Region Transit Commission. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lennox, questions? I do. Um, just wondering uh, if Mr. Fleming could uh, speak again just quickly on what would be the next off ramp opportunity or is this coming before council again or is this over now? Uh, so through your worship, there's no formal off ramp opportunity that we're bringing back to council. Council has the opportunity to to take an off ramp anytime up until when the board is going to be stood up, which we've been told to expect something um, could be uh, October or later. Um, but again, I have no firm date on that. So anytime up until that point, we can. Um, I do believe we'll be back in front of council though to discuss the motion that was made at the last council meeting about the Strathcona County option. So in theory, I guess that would probably be the next logical point when transit is uh, discussed. Okay, thank you. And for those who um, are uh, interested in the alternate position, I'm wondering if uh, there can be some clarification as to what the meeting times are they daytime meetings or are they evening meetings usually your worship mr I harris yeah, yeah. Councilor harris. Um, we have ha been having the virtual meetings during the day um uh, so that has been fairly easy this last one we had last week to advance it to the next stage was held in person at the transit garage uh, on the yellowhead so that was a day meeting in the past, as you were aware, when you participated, when we initially rolled this out, Councillor Lennox, they were day meetings uh, because all the other participants typically are available during the day. Uh, so that ultimately is the limiting factor. Uh, I suspect we're going to continue to see the uh, virtual meetings, which makes it a little easier for people to attend them. So again, I can't be, uh, I can't be certain that that has yet to be determined. Thank you. Okay. You're good. Okay. Uh, Councillor Macon, you're the next one to put on a motion. Uh, sure. Um, just read it off here. I'll make the motion that Council appoint Councillor Gordon Harris to the Regional Transit Services Commission RTSC Interim Board. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to speak to that motion? Um, I think Councillor Harris has done an exceptional job on that um, in on that. Uh, committee before and um i think it's a uh, in the absence of anyone else wanting to take a shot at i think he will make an excellent candidate so we'll leave it at that okay thank you so on the motion Councillor kelly anything uh yes you'll note that i didn't make a comment in the last round of questions unlike most of my fellow councillors um at this time, I will say that I too support Councillor Harris for this for this uh, interim board position. He's a logical choice, no question. The discussions that were floating around between administration and council for the last week had nothing to do with an appointment and everything to do with the process. And uh, I'll leave it at that. I'm, uh, I look forward to continuing reports and uh, moving forward with it, Gord. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Anything on the motion? You're good. Councillor Harris, anything on the motion? Um, no, just to say, I thank uh, thank Council for their support on this. Uh, this is about just continuing the discussion. So I guess any role, whether it's the primary member or the alternate member, it's to represent the interests of our city in those discussions and at this point to stand up the commission as it moves forward so we need to have ongoing discussions about these things as a council so that so that each member uh, can represent their particular interests going forward and that's what i would intend to do again it's 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 only uh, effectively the uh, the transition team uh, rebranded for just a short period of time so it'll probably be by the end of the year would it would be stood down if that was the case and the interim or the regular board would be appointed at some point. So that's really the way I see it. And uh, I appreciate the support and I would do the best job I possibly can going forward. 
Okay, thank you. Councillor Sperling on the motion. I'll support Councillor Harris's uh, appointment to the Regional Transit Services Commission. Thank you. Uh, I'm next in the order. I'll support Councillor Harris as well. I think you've been doing a stellar job and it's been a lot of hours being put into it. So I appreciate your time that uh, you've been spending on that. Uh, Councillor Lennox on the motion. Uh, I'll support the motion, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Macon, anything on close? Nothing on close, thank you. Thank you. Motion is now closed. Please cast your vote at Council Point. Councillor Harris to the Regional Transit Services Commission Interim Board. Please cast your vote. Councillor Abatoye, yours is not registering. Voted in support. Thank you. The voting is closed. That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. So, damn, sorry, <laughs> keep muting. Um, the next one is for the uh, appointment um, for an alternate. Um, so I guess the first question that I would probably ask is uh, who would be interested in that? And uh, I guess if you're interested, I'm just going to go through the list. If you're interested, just say you are or you aren't, and then we can um, um, basically make a decision based on that or put names forward. So um, Councillor uh, Kelly. Uh, you thank you. Thank you. I'm not. Okay, thank you. Councillor Abatoye. Looks like someone already indicated interest, so no, I'm not. Yes, one did, but I need to just confirm if there is anybody else interested so that we can uh, go through a proper process. Councillor yes. Harris, you're already on no. it. Councillor Sperling, do you have any interest? I'll defer to the interested party. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lennox. No, thank you. I'm not interested. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Macon did indicate she was interested. Uh, Councillor Kelly, would you like to put a motion forward since we only have one interested uh, first, one interested representative? Uh, Councillor Abatoya was saying something just as the mic went off. I just want to confirm that her, her position is still not interested. Oh, no, saying I'm not interested. Perfect. Thank you. I'll make the motion. I move the council. I move the council appoint Councillor Macon as an alternate councillor to the Regional Transit Service Commission interim board. Thank you very much. Do you wish to speak in favor? Uh, I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to go through this on discussion and debate because I have just asked everybody on their interest. Uh, does anybody have anything on discussion and debate? Okay, I'm going to go through it then. Councillor Abatoye on discussion and debate. No, you're good. Councillor Harris on discussion and debate. Uh, Councillor Sperling, you're good. Councillor Lennox. I do. I just have, I just want to express, I guess, a little bit of a concern um, because Councillor Macon has um, said previously that she finds it difficult to attend daytime meetings. Um, so I just maybe wondering how that would fit into her schedule. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Macon is next. So um, Councillor Macon, do you just want to confirm that you're able to do the daytime meetings for this? Uh, yeah, so um, as, as we know, Councillor Harris is the main person on this uh, committee, and uh, if he 
were to say that he couldn't make a meeting, I would do my absolute best to handle it. I um, I can't foresee it being a problem with uh, meetings here and there. Does that answer your question? Councillor Lennox? It does, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bacon, anything? No. Thank you. Councillor Kelly, to close on the motion? Nothing further to add, thank you. Thank you, so the motion is now closed that Councillor Macon uh, be appointed as alternate uh, to the Regional Transit Services Commission Interim Board. Please cast your vote. Okay, that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Councillor Harris and Councillor Macon. Okay, the next item that we have is line of credit borrowing amending bylaw. Clayton Northey presenting. Good evening, Your Worship and members of Council again. Um, I'm here to request that Council give three readings to uh, bylaw C24 20, which amends the line of credit borrowing bylaw C2018 or sorry, C18-20, uh, to increase the amount of authorized, uh, the amount authorized for the city to make a borrowing for the purposes of financing the ongoing operating expenditures of the city. Um, back in March, um, Council passed, uh, passed the line of credit borrowing bylaw C18-20, which authorized the city to borrow up to 20 million for the purposes of financing ongoing operations and to mitigate the risks, um, unknown, level of risk that we are going into with COVID-19. Subsequent to the passage of that bylaw, um, the city had, was approached by two financial institutions uh, offering revolving credit line facilities of $20 million each um, at an interest rate of prime minus 0.5%, um, which works out to currently, at, or as of June 30th, or 3rd, and I believe today, uh, is 1.95 percent. Um, as at June 33rd, the city has established a credit facility with one of those financial institutions, but has not made any borrowings pursuant to that bylaw. Um, the city is allowed under the MGA to borrow up to approximately 48 million, um, or uh, and at um, December, at December uh, 31st, um, the city was using approximately 29% of its uh, statutory debt limit. Um, and as of April 30th, I believe that was 20% um, uh, uh, of its debt service limit. Um, uh, the reason we're looking for this at this point in time, um, A, is that, that we have two lenders that are offering um, to provide up to a, a joint amount of $40 million. Um, given the significant amount of financial uncertainty in the market, um, the significant amount of uh, uncertainty going into 2021 and beyond, uh, we do believe that it's prudent to lock up um, credit this credit facility um, at this time um, to allow any um, allow for greater flexibility for unforeseen circumstances. Um, this would, the additional for going to a $40 million credit facility in a worst case scenario would give us a six month cushion instead of a three month cushion approximately for, um, to modify our operations or reduce our spending further. Um, if there was a significant impact or deferral of taxes that came forward over the next period. With that, I'm open to any questions. Uh, and okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Kelly, you're first for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton. Refresh my memory, please. With the existing line of credit or the, the new line of credit limits as if, if this is approved, what is administration's discretion 
on drawing down on those lines of credit. Do we uh, do we need council motions for that, or is it open to use as administration sees fit? Um, to your worship, uh, the original bylaw was open, uh, fairly open. Um, the amending bylaw, one of the amendments we've added to it was um, 3.7, which requires that we notify council within 10 days of any borrowing being made. Um, we could strengthen that further if needed, but um, the intent is to keep council informed of any decisions that we make as we make them. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not a banker, so are there any fees, standby fees, management fees, fees of any type that um, attach to these various, the, the original account or the new one if we in fact approve it? Whether Go Through ahead. your worship, Councillor Kelly, there is no cost to either of the facilities that have been presented to us um, of any kind. There's no holding, withholding or a standby fee or anything like that, although that is a normal practice, but in this case, they have that's not what they've offered. And these lines of credit are reviewed or renewed how often? Um, these would be renewed. Um, uh, on an annual basis, I believe. With the lending institution annually. Within, with, it, with the lending institution annually. Um, anything that goes beyond a three-year period would require um, a advertisement, which is not the intent of what we're doing here. The goal here would be to get us through the next period, um, the next 18 months, 24 months, depending on what COVID looks like and the subsequent uh, economic impact. And then um, if we did have to draw down on these facilities, we would pro roll them into a finance, a, a longer term financing to um, repay them rather than doing it all at once. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the responses. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Your presentation, um, Quentin. Um, so did you say that if we're to draw from this line of credit and you move it to a long term um, um, long-term um, product, and so we're able to pay monthly for that. Look, how does that work? Um, that is looking way down the road at this point. Okay. Um, there's a number of different options that we would be able to do, um, depending on whether it's through at the Alberta Capital Financing Authority okay. or through another process. Um, and I couldn't speculate at this time. Okay, okay, that's fine. Um, so it looks like you're, we're being offered a really good rate and that's why we're taking advantage. So are we taking advantage of the really good rates we're being offered right now or do we envisage that we're gonna be needing up to $40 million? Um, through your worship, it's a, this is a, to Councillor Abitoya, this is a little bit of both. Um, we are looking at these rates being available now. We. I, we want to act on them, but the bigger concern is that we want to be in the best position possible to maintain uh, municipal services going forward over the, again, over the next period of significant uncertainty. Um, and that's where we want to make sure that we have enough liquidity to um, pay our bills as they come due, pay our staff as they come due, um, pay uh, other, um, things like uh, education, property taxes, and so on and so forth, as they fall due. And this just gives us a greater level of flexibility. Flexibility. Okay, thank you. And I do agree with your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Um, so Clayton, the question I've got is, um, are you aware, I, I suspect all municipalities are having to enter into these types of um, arrangements uh, for kind of ongoing um, financial requirements but are you aware of any municipalities kind of within your peer group that uh, aren't doing this uh, or doing something different is this kind of a standard process given um, the circumstances uh through your worship councillor harris um i do know of a number of municipalities that have done this i haven't polled anyone who hasn't i believe recently strathcona county increased their um their operating line of credit from $5 million to $120 million, um, if memory serves. Um, and other municipalities have done largely the same. 
So this becomes kind of a leading practice in response to this type of a, a categoric uh, challenge. At, at, through your worship, Councillor Harris, that's absolutely correct. Thank you. Councillor Sperling. <clears throat> I just have a question for Mr. Fleming, first of all. Troy, why don't we include the dollar amount of the line of credit in the motion? Um, through your worship, I'll, I'll leave it to Mr. Northey for that. Um, just let me pull up the motion here. Um, I, I don't think it's in the motion, but I do believe that it is in the bylaw and it's in the body of the report. If I'm not mistaken. You know I, I know that, but I struggled with it last time too when we created a $20 million line. It, the $20 million should have been identified in this as original motion as well it just provides more clarity um yeah and through your worship unless mr Northy has another reason i i'd say we can take that feedback uh, away for the next time if there is a next time but or amend the motion just to tag it tag it on to the end to 40 million dollars yeah mr uh, Northy. through your worship there's nothing uh to councillor uh, sperling there's nothing that would prevent us from amending the motion that way uh it doesn't change the intent of the motion no Exactly. And it's just, it provides just a little more clarity. That's all. So should I put an amending motion on your worship? We don't have a main motion yet. So okay. we're not there. Okay. All right. I have one more question. Clayton mentioned that uh, council would be given notice at 10 days. And my question is when we go to draw down the line of credit, my question is, is that 10 days before or 10 days after we draw down money? Um, through your worship to Councillor Sperling, um, the motion is, I'm oh, sorry, the, the amended bylaw is vague on that. Um, it could be read either way. Um, that wasn't, that again could be modified if Council wished it to be. I'm just wondering the, the purpose of the notice. If you're giving a 10 day notice after the money's been drawn down, that's really probably a little pointless if you're giving 10 days notice in advance i'm not sure you know how quickly it, you're probably going to draw it down fairly quickly right you, it's not necessarily a 10-day notice that you want um through your worship again we do have um uh, we are doing some pretty good um cash flow forecasting so we should know when that's needed in advance um and again we are trying to keep council informed of uh where we're at with that on a monthly basis um the that said if it wanted if uh councillor sparling wished it to be more clear um it could be modified to clarify that it's prior to uh the drawdown i think that's yeah if you make a change that's the change i would make just say that it would be 10 days prior to drawdown anyways those are my thoughts okay thank you a uh, question for our parliamentary uh, person, Ms. Moulter. So uh, within within the bylaw, it actually states what the amendment is for the borrowing bylaw. So I guess the question before we get into a motion and potential amending emotions, uh, where are you there? Um, is it necessary to do that or is it because it's contained within the bylaw, it's not required? So I'll get your uh, input. Your Worship, my um, my belief is that because the bylaw itself contains all of those details, it, it isn't necessary to have it in the motion. Uh, if Council wishes to include the note of the 20 million, that can be presented at the time uh, the motion is, is made. It doesn't, we don't need to do an amending motion for that. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. I just wanted clarification on that. And I guess my other question uh, is to Mr. Northey. So if these two financial institutions had not come forward off making this offering, would we have even considered this? Uh, through your worship to count the, sorry, to your worship, um, the, uh, we wouldn't probably have done this quite so quickly. Um, however, 
we it is something that we were looking at and considering even before bringing the 20 million on stream um, as to what the right amount of a of that line of credit um, should be um, in order to mitigate the risk that we have um, before us. Um, the, the risk is at this point that um, down the road, the credit uh, facilities that are available to us a year from now may not, um, and when we actually need it, or six months from now when we actually need it, may tighten up significantly. Um, and if, that's, if that happens, um, I would rather put it out to council. Uh, I believe we would like to put, we'd rather put it out to council now to make that decision to lock up the credit facility where it's available um, than to be scrambling and having to take a higher interest loan or um, in order to preserve our liquidity. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lennox. I don't have any further questions, thanks. Councillor Macon. Uh, nothing from me, thanks. Thanks for all the uh, clarifying uh, answers, Clayton. Councillor Kelly, anything further? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, Clayton, your last comment caused me to ask this question yet again. Uh, the preferential rate of 2% approximately that lasts one year. Is that guaranteed for one year or is that subject to quarterly adjustment? Like, what, what's the terms on that? Um, please. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, that is, not, is a variable rate um, loan. It's prime minus 0.5. Currently, at, if the Bank of Canada doesn't make another change or banks don't make another change, it's at 1.95%. Um, However, if the prime rate starts to change, then we would then that one is a variable rate. And it's not going to lock us in that way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so the but the prime component of, of the rate that's could go from prime minus 0 0.05 to prime plus two percent one year on on the first anniversary or prime plus something on the anniversary. Is that correct? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, that is correct. Um, and we were quoted a range in, in the initial um, report. We were quoted a range as high as um, getting, I believe it was plus 1%. And that range might change if, in fact, we borrowed a full $40 million. So that gets me to a question for Mr. Fleming, if I may, Mayor Catcher, my third question. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Troy. What's the plan? Have you guys give any thought to your response from an administrative perspective um, that would happen, say, between the drawdown of the 20th million and the drawdown of the 40th to make sure that we don't need to draw down the 40th million? You guys got a, a, got a contingency plan within your administration to, to, to hopefully ensure that we never need this money? Um, yeah, through your worship, I would say in a formal perspective, no, we don't have such a plan. Um, we're, we're living in pretty unprecedented times here. I think, I think securing the credit is part one. Um, but I, I think that's something we would have to take back and discuss really what you're talking about are probably pretty significant modifications to the city services. And, and, um, in a general sense, that would probably be a conversation for both administration and council. And and I agree with your comment, but to go forty million dollars in debt in a period of three or four months means, like it or not, we're going to modify significantly city 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 services and city service levels. So it's best to plan ahead. So and this is something I didn't anticipate before tonight. So will administration take this back, or would you guys look for for a notice of motion from a councillor? accepted by council to to give this some thought and report back to council sometime early in the fall. Um, through your worship, I, I would say it depends how formal you want. If you want me to just take it away as an information request and provide a simple comment back to council, we can do that. Um, I can just take that if you're looking for 
um, work to be done where we've where we've got to basically go back and work with the departments and come up with a formal strategy, then that would probably be best served as a notice of motion. Do you see? Do you see a, a need for something more formal than what you have now for a strategy? I'd say for now, if you. If you're asking for my preference, I would say allow me to take that away as an information request and we'll just have a uh, maybe call it like a starters discussion with the leadership team and uh, provide some comment back. I think really what you have to do is look at the city's budget at a high level. It's it kind of reminds me of the provincial government when they talk about cutting the budget, but not wanting to cut health and education like you can't you got to look at the big pieces of the city's budget if you want to make a dent the size of 40 million dollars so um i think there would be significant amount of of um difficult decisions to be made but at a high level we could provide a comment back to council and if you want more than that then that's then we could help you with the notice of motion uh, one comment but before i make the comment i think that's a satisfactory response troy i guess the point that that really needs to be considered is that if we the city was forced to borrow 40 million dollars in the next year that the problems don't end there. We're not all of a sudden going to improve our cash flow by $40 million, which means no further debt in the next year. So, so we need to be making changes and significant changes way before we get to that level, or we will never dig our way out. That's my opinion. Um, I look forward to your unofficial comment and, and I'm good, Mayor Catcher. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Abatoye, would you like to put the motion on? You wanna put the motion on? Is that a yes or a no? Can you unmute? Thank you. There you are. Okay, I will make a motion that Council gives first reading to bylaw C24-20, which amends bylaw C18-20 as presented. Thank you. Would you like to speak in favor of it? Um, no, I think we said everything that needs to be said. The city needs cash flows and we've been in unprecedented times. It's important that we have um, access to this um, funds when needed. So um, I think it's a good thing. We're just being prudent and it's the right step to be making right now. Okay, thank you. The motion is open for discussion and debate. Councillor Harris, you're next. I mean, nothing. I support the motion. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sperling. I hesitate to support the motion. I do believe it is incomplete with no dollar amount included. Thank you. Thank you. I'll support the motion. It is contained within the actual bylaw itself. When I first actually uh, read this, I had a lot of reservations uh, about approving another $20 million. And uh, Mr. Northey, you've provided me some comfort in your explanation, but I hope we never get to this point that we have to draw a penny off of the original 20. So um, because of your influence, I uh, will support this motion. Councillor Lennox. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's pretty daunting, a pretty daunting number um, and would really, uh, would not be good, obviously, if the city of Fort Saskatchewan was in a position to have to use um, all of it um, or any of it. So, uh, but I did appreciate also um, Mr. Northey's um, comments and clarifications and I thought it was a really good discussion so I'll support the motion thanks thank you Councillor Macon on the motion uh yeah I'm going to support the motion um I know that it sounds daunting but I think that taking um advantage of the low interest rates by locking down this now so that it's there if we need it um, then that is prudent for us to do, but uh, I also have a lot of confidence that the City of Fort Saskatchewan will not need this going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kelly, on debate. Yes, thank you. I agree, I too am confident that the City of Fort Saskatchewan will need the money. 
I am not going to vote in favor of the motion. I honestly believe, fellow councillors, that way before needing the 25th million, that this council should be making some serious decisions on limiting our exposure and our cash burn rate. So, so I was reluctant to approve 20 million, uh, but I can see that to go to 40 without a plan and, and even an informal plan without a few steps written down on paper and formalized a little bit, I'm extremely reluctant. So I think 20 million is enough. I don't think we need 40. And uh, that being said, I'm not in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye, to close. Yeah, um, so this um, borrowing is for operating expenditures. So I believe that the city wouldn't be going spending for just spending sake, ex except it is absolutely needed. Um, and so for that reason, I think I'm confident in moving forward with this motion. So I support the motion. Thank you. The motion is now closed. That council give first reading to bylaw C twenty four twenty. Oh, um, we can take additional comments on second. It has been closed. So this is on first reading. It is now closed on first reading. Please cast your vote. Carried five to two. All right, you can go ahead with uh, second reading, Councillor Abatoye. You need to unmute. I'm pretty sure I unmuted, but I guess I just didn't respond. Okay. I will make a motion that council gives second reading to bylaw C24-20, which amends B, uh, which amends bylaw C18-20 as presented. Okay, thank you. Do you wish to speak in favor? Um, no, I think I said all I need to say. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. I've been asked to go through the uh, order again. Uh, Councillor Harris, anything further on second? No, I think uh, good comments, um, you know, up to this point in time. Um, I, I see it's a prudent thing to do. It's just called pre-planning. Uh, there's enough uh, kind of off-ramps that council will be able to provide its input well before we get to the point of calling down the $25 million, I suspect. Thank you. Councillor Sperling, on second. Nothing to say. Thank you. I have nothing further, Councillor Lennox. Um, yeah, I just want to maybe kind of flesh this out a little bit more. There is, um, I think there's merit to what uh, Councillor Kelly is saying. Um, and I don't, you know, as much as I have confidence in administration to not get to that point, it does make me nervous um to think that we could actually use um you know 20 million dollars let alone 40 million dollars um if this goes through but it doesn't obtain unanimous consent what happens after that does it come back then next meeting for the yep. final final approval yeah so we come back on july 7th if that's our next meeting whatever our next meeting is okay and will mr fleming have some uh sort of sense as to a strategy by then or how is that um through your worship my intent is to take it back and have a high level conversation i'm taking it as an information request so we're not going to be um you know rooting through all the departments and creating anything sophisticated but i mean i at a high level i i strongly agree with the comment that if we were heading down a if we were heading down a hill so steep that we were going to get to a place where we're even 10, 20 million dollars into needing this money, that there is serious conversations that need to be had with council and administration and even the community in some respect. So, but what I'm going to, what we can do for the July 7th meeting is provide as part of the report, I guess, if, if we are coming back, 
we can provide a high level comment. Um, probably with the, the different options that council is going to have, how you would actually pull on those levers. Um, would, you know, we can't really determine that yet, but we could just sort of say these are the different options in terms of cost cutting and tax increases and revenue and fee increases and, and things like that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Macon, anything further on second? Um, I appreciate the comments that were made. I do um, have confidence in our administration that prior to even going through half of the $20 million that we will see things back. So um, look forward to the comments that Troy brings back and um, I'm comfortable to vote on this as in favor. Thank you, Councillor Kelly on second. Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate everybody's comments and I stress I too have confidence in our administration, immense confidence, but my job as a counselor isn't to share my confidence with administration. My job as counselor, the way I see it, is to, to, to act on my fiduciary duty for the people that voted for me. And that might mean questioning administration sometime. That is simply business and that's what we're here for. Um, Troy, I appreciated your comments to Councillor Lennox's question. And I think that's really what the, 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 uh, the feedback that I was looking for. Now I'm going to ask you again, we don't need, I, I'm not anticipating that you'd come with some sort of detailed budget that had breakpoints and numbers in it, not at all, but a plan that would say that before we draw down the first million, we're going to have this kind of conversation with council. Before we draw down the 10th million, we're going to have this kind of conversation with council. That sort of high level document is really what I'm looking for. Um, to know then that we're going to have at predetermined checkpoints, should this get as bad as this might imply, that we're going to have the council break points. And uh, you might give some hint into there as to what potential changes could be made. And I agree with you. You can only look at the, at the big spending pools. You can't look at the small ones. They don't make up 40 million. So is it possible, Troy? And, and I know you've been busy and I know you're still busy, but is it possible to have this in place or some sort of response put together for council by the July 7th meeting? Uh, yeah, to your worship, and I don't, this isn't meant to be sarcastic. I can put together any kind of a response in any kind of a time frame. The question is how adequate is it? Um, if, if that is the desire of council, we'll, we'll um, put the pedal to the metal and have something for July 7th. And then um, if it's satisfactory, that'll, that'll take care of it. And, and then if we think more discussion is needed, then um, we can come up with a strategy as to how to address that. And I appreciate those res that response. Thank you. I guess if, if the initial response on July 7th isn't adequate, that just means that we should be having the conversation and that perhaps it's more involved than all of us think it could be. So, so I'm going to vote for, for number two, but I'm, I'm going to either refer the unanimous decision or vote against it. And I'll be looking for, for guidance from the chair so that this thing comes back on July 7th for just a follow-up discussion. Thank you. Okay, so um, I would say that um, we can deal with second and then we can refer it and uh, but refer with what your request is. If council supports referral, then uh, it will come back with the information requested. Uh, if not, it'll go to unanimous or to unanimous consent vote if that fails and it just comes back to um, to July 7th as, as presented. Okay, so let's deal with second and then um, as the motion comes on for unanimous consent, it can be just put forward for a modus uh, to refer. <coughs> okay, Councillor Abatoye to close. Okay, um, I do see reason with what um, Councillor Kelly just said. And um, I like what Troy said. So yeah, we're gonna bring saying the report back, you know, in response to those questions. I think they are valid. So, um, so we're going to vote on set on second right now. 
So just, what I would suggest then is if you're looking for that as well, he could go back and just put the motion on to refer at this point in time. And then your motion is referred and we deal with second and third at the next meeting. Because okay, it doesn't have to come back. That sounds okay with me. Okay, so I'll go back to Councillor Kelly. You can put your motion on to refer it to, I think it's July 7th is our next meeting. So let me check our dates. Yeah, it's July 7th. Okay, thank you. I move to refer second reading of bylaw C24-20 to the July 7th, 2020 meeting. You need me to continue with the neck with a reason or a cause? Uh, with what you're requesting. Okay. Um, I would request with that referral that administration bring back the type of report to council that we spent the last 10 minutes talking about. In other words, a, a bit of a contingency plan. Okay, so uh, administration will craft a referral motion to refer this to July 7th and to bring it back with uh, a type of financial plan. I'm good with that. Thank you. Okay. Are you, uh, Ms. Moulter, are you able to craft that? Your Worship, I'm just working on that right now. I'll just meet you a moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, while she's working on that, uh, referral motions are debatable. So, because um, it's a referral motion, I'll go through the, we all know what the referral motion is. So I'll just go through the discussion and debate for the referral motion. So Councillor Abatoye, anything on discussion and debate of referral? Um, no, I'll support the referral. Um, I see I see um, some valid reasons and the things that Councillor Kelly said. Um, I mean, when I first saw this, I was a bit concerned, but with the comments made by Mr. Nothi, I thought, oh, well, maybe it's not a bad idea, but I think it's, a, I think it's, um, it's, uh, it's prudent for us to get some more information about how this is going to be handled when we do get there. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harris, anything on the referral? Nothing to add. <laughs> Councillor Sperling, anything on the referral? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm fine. Councillor Lennox on the referral? I'll support the referral motion. Thanks. Councillor Macon on the referral? Uh, just that I'll support it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Kelly to close on referral. Uh, thank you. Nothing further to add. Okay, thank you. So the motion uh, should be coming up here shortly. Your Worship, could I just ask for clarification uh, of the motion? I have a motion that bylaw C24-20 be referred to the July 7th, 2020 council meeting. And then it's just the last part to also include, was it information or, I'm sorry, I didn't get that last part. I believe it's uh, a financial plan. To include a financial plan. Or procedures to deal with the drawdown of the debt, potential drawdown of the debt. Okay, so procedures to deal with the drawdown of the debt. To, okay. Okay, we'll try this. Councillor Kelly, I'll just have you, can you read that? I have people in front of part of my motions or part of the motion. I can, could I ask to Brenda and add the word to include, just meant to include, to address the financial impact of the debt, of the drawdown of the debt. Sorry, Councillor Kelly, that was to include procedures to address the drawdown of the debt and? Address, after the word address, the financial impact of the drawdown of the debt. So what I'm after are procedures 
that would look at the financial impact, not the financial impact itself right now. Obviously, we don't have that, but some just some procedures. Just confirm that it's correct. Thank you. Good, good go. Good to go. Okay. So, did you wish to close or you're good? Nothing further to add. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, the motion is now closed um, that bylaw C2420 be referred to the July 7th, uh, 2020 council meeting as presented. Please cast your vote. Councillor Abatoye, your assistant coming up. Voted in support. Okay, thank you. Voting is closed. It's carried 6 1. Thank you very much. So that will be referred to the July 7th meeting. So we will move on to the next item, which is a notice of motion. Uh, this was uh, Councillor Kelly's notice of motion. So I'll have you read it in and then you can speak to it. Yes, thank you. Um, I move that council submit a proposed motion to the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board, brackets known as EMRB, that the EMRB revise their timeliness for member municipality agenda distribution to two weeks in advance of meeting dates in order to allow for sufficient time to review the meeting content. I'll accept the motion. You wish to speak in favor of it? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, I, to speak to it, I'll reference the provincial regulation that created the um, Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board, Region Board. And the particular paragraph is section two, bracket six. And I'm just gonna read it in part. It says representatives appointed are expected to represent the perspectives of their respective municipality during board deliberations. So that's worth noting, representatives appointed represent the perspective of their respective municipality. And, and it's become apparent that when you have a part-time council, we're pushed for time to, to address these issues and they tend to fall in weeks, the MRB meetings tend to fall in a week when we also have a council meeting and, and our own agenda stuff to look after. I'm uh, thinking that two weeks is a, rather than one week is a reasonable compromise. It shouldn't affect their operations to any significant degree, but I think to live up to the mandate as envisioned by the provincial government, that um, it's incumbent upon the EMRB to give member councils a time and the opportunity to consider appropriate, properly the, the agenda material that they're putting forward. Thank you. Thank you. So the motion is accepted. It's been spoken in favor of. It's open for discussion and debate. Councillor Abatoye, you're first. So I would actually like to hear from the AMRB members. Um, what do you think about this motion? How often do you meet? Okay, what I would suggest, um, I can take that as a question and then uh, we can answer that as we're going through, or I can answer it right now if you like. Yeah, um, I'd prefer that. 
Okay, so the EMRB uh, currently is meeting uh, every two months. The uh, intention going into the fall, if the charter is approved, is it'll move to one meeting a month and one kind of committee of the whole a month. So, so it'll still be a formal meeting every two months, but a commit kind of like a committee of the whole meeting on the, on the second month because they have an executive committee right now, but um, they are planning on changing that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harris. So I'm curious um, why we're just singling out the MRB. Why don't we uh, uh, make this request of all of our boards, committees, and commissions, um, and that all matters that are going to be discussed around all of those tables be discussed in a fulsome way uh, around our council table. Notwithstanding, it would probably increase the length of our agendas probably about sixfold. But why um, why are we singling out the MRB? And uh, are, are we not confident that the mayor can represent the interests uh, of the community given her length of service to the community and uh, her knowledge of ultimately uh, kind of, uh, you know, how we would likely uh, respond to things? So that's, that's kind of a two-part question. Why and why are we singling out the MRB? Okay, we are in uh, discussion and Bakes, the motion is on there. So Councillor Kelly would answer that question. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Harris. Why the EMRB? Well, quite simply, the impact of the EMRB on, on member communities, member municipalities is very large on an ongoing basis. I sit on the Water Commission, you sit on the Wastewater Commission. Uh, I assure you that if there was a significant, if we were going to turn off the water to the city of Fort Saskatchewan, I'd be storming the council immediately. If we're going to reduce the supply of water to the city of Fort Saskatchewan, I would be reporting to council immediately. But when it's business as usual, I report the issues that I have much like you do. The MRB is a different cat. It is very active. It's far more active than its counterpart in Calgary, for instance. And its decisions affect us in a meaningful way for multi-generations. So that is why the MRB. Uh, I have no problem with Mayor Catcher sitting on the EMRB, so I'm not singling out Mayor Catcher. I, I point out the simple fact that the Municipal Government Act for Alberta says that cities will elect seven councillors. I assume cities elect seven councillors because they felt that seven individuals can give a better representation of what the community thinks is important as opposed to one. And I don't think that any one individual, period, and I can't imagine who that individual could be, could possibly claim to have their finger on the pulse of the entire community. So MRB, because it's important, uh, why am I concerned? It says quite clearly, you're going to take the, re the interests of your community and our community elects seven councillors. And I think seven councillors should at least understand what's going on and be given the chance to, to, to offer comment. Thank you. Councillor Harris, you still have the floor. Um, well, to the, to the question, we'll, we'll, that, yeah, it's important. Um, I think a lot of the stuff they do is business as usual, but what about the other boards and committees and commissions? Why don't we, why don't we just do something radical and make them uh, report the same way so that we can all sit around, so we can all talk about water, we can all talk about wastewater, we can all talk about hardland housing issues. I mean, at some point in time, I think it's called the delegation of responsibilities, divvying up the responsibilities notwithstanding the seven uh, elected officials that are proposed under the legislation to form a, a decision-making body called a uh, council. So uh, that's, I guess, a more of a rhetorical question for all of you. Um, why not include, what, let's, let's lump in everything else and see how that goes. And if it works, maybe we're all better informed. I don't know, it's a wild, uh, it's a wild concept. I'm just putting it out there. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sperling on the motion. Thank you. 
Uh, so I'm not going to support the motion, even if we were to uh, approve this motion, it still goes before the board to make a final decision on whether the board is prepared uh, to to change their their procedures in order to change their timelines. And um, I think that that's, you know, I, I do believe, I'm not sure the exact time frame, but I do believe we had this conversation a couple of years ago, and it was similar to, to even our council one, that the optimal time was provided and um, that there wasn't a request to actually change the time frame. Um, I, I believe that, you know, we do each have a fiduciary responsibility to each of our boards and committees, and each one of them can have a very uh, significant impact on our communities. Now, with the MRB, even though the board only meets every two months, the um, the Ag, uh, Ag Task Force, CSISB, the IRTMP, um, you know, the uh, each one of those uh, working groups meets more than that, but now they have gotten into a process of actually sending out their information, a communications update that is going up to all of uh, members of council and I'm making sure that those are going out. So anything that comes to the board, unless it's a um, notice of motion from a member, municipal uh, member municipality is already being dealt with by a working group and uh, those are provided as information. So when those communications come out, those are the communications that could be talked about uh, at any of the council meetings. And I think that, you know, that's probably more relevant because they would be more up to date. So uh, based on that, I wouldn't be supporting this unless, uh, you know, everybody's sports and committees have to do a review. So I'm good with that. Uh, Councillor Lennox. I do think that it's um, kind of telling that, you know, a representative of the committee um, doesn't support, or I guess it's indicative of the division within the council with re in regards to the committee. Um, I do think that to not listen to the concerns and to not understand um, the significance of that particular committee on our residents and on our community. And it it really bothers me that the majority of this work being done is being done behind closed doors. Um, and it took this council over a year to even start getting any information in regards to EMRB. So I think a lot of us, or at least some of us, are trying to even catch up as to what is actually going on because there's so much going on. Um, so I think that it's a little bit obtuse to suggest that the EMRB is no less significant than any of the other boards or committees that we sit on. Because if it was less significant, and then it wouldn't be our mayor sitting on it. And it wouldn't be a collaboration of all the all of the leaders within this region. So I don't think that there's merit to that. Um, I think that we all have a duty to understand exactly what's going on here. And I do when I, when the EMRB uh, presented earlier. I think that we really need to start thinking about long term and how this is all going to unfold and what these regional conversations could really turn into. And if we are not engaged in that, we could find ourselves in a position where all of us are looking back and thinking, boy, I wish that we, we would have known more, or I wish that we would have been more involved, or I wish we would have been more engaged. These are big conversations happening, and we all have a duty to be involved in those conversations. And you have a duty to listen to the rest of us um when we express our concerns about those conversations so i will support the motion um and that those are my thoughts okay thank you councillor macon um 
I guess just in response to some things that have been said, I don't think that anything at the EMRB necessarily happens behind closed doors. I think that we are provided um, lots of information on the EMRB and we requested more or members of council requested more information and, and we've certainly been getting it. Um, whether or not getting uh, the agenda two weeks or one week. Um, Councillor Kelly, you made a comment that that won't significantly impact them. I personally, I don't know if that will significantly impact them. I have no idea um, if that's true or not. So um, I think that the mayor uh, made good points when she said it, it's not really about the agenda to get this information and, and to be uh, involved and up to date. It's really about the other information that we receive uh, that is more telling of what's happening, these updates that come from different um, subcommittees of the EMRB. So I think that I am satisfied with the responses on that. And um, I don't I don't know if I support the motion or not. Again, I don't sit on the EMRB, so I don't know if um, what they're going to say or how they're going to uh, take this notice but um, I suppose that it can't hurt to get it two weeks in advance as long as the EMRB I guess thinks that 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 they can do that so um, I'm not sure I'll listen to the other comments. Thank you I'm going to go through round two again Councillor Kelly. Yes yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, The, whether or not the EMRB can handle the request, I guess, is ultimately their decision. But um, there's nothing stopping us as a member municipality from making the request. And we ought not to be embarrassed to make the request. Simple, quite simply, we ought not. It's, it's as indicated by Mayor Catcher, this subject has come up before. Now, it didn't pass, the motion apparently didn't pass the last time, but who knows, we might not be the only council now sitting out there concerned with the process. Uh, I'll remind my fellow councillors that we tend to talk about the AMRB in our in-camera sessions. Those in-camera sessions are very full of information and those in-camera sessions happen on Tuesday and typically the AMRB meetings happen, I believe, on a Thursday or a Friday. I'll also remind people, my fellow councillors, that the, the MRB meets every two months, but in the last couple of months, we've had the MRB deal with, with a couple um, emergency meetings or special meetings. So, and as indicated by Mayor Catcher, they're planning on increasing the intensity of the number of meetings. I don't know how any council is going to keep up to that stuff, and perhaps they ought to be told that as well. Uh, they don't necessarily have their own agenda. I honestly and firmly believe they exist because other councils exist, in fact, 13 of them. So, so with that in mind, I'm not the least embarrassed to ask them to give us more time to do our work. It's only fair and reasonable. I look forward to their response. Uh, I'm just trying to do the best job I can as a councillor. And, and I know Councillor Harris's points that he last made were rhetorical. But I've point out that, of course, the option exists for any councillor to to put forward a notice of motion as they see fit going forward. So I'll leave it at that. I think it behooves us to do the best job we can, and we cannot do that if we're consistently rushed with information. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abatoy, and se second round. So I assume that if this passes, then it's a letter that's going to be signed by you. Uh, Mayor Catcher, to the EMRB ask requesting this, or how, what's the process? If this passes, then uh, I would send an email in of uh, notice of motion, and it has to be received within so many days before a uh, board meeting. I don't believe that uh, this one would actually get to the board until August, if we have a meeting in August. Um, Otherwise, it would go to the September meeting. So it would be just an email confirming what the uh, notice of motion would be as presented by our council. 
Okay, so so um, so you are going to be presenting a notice of motion, right? That's, That's correct. What you said. Okay, so you kind of have to speak in favor of it because you're presenting the notice of motion. I would represent our community as requested. Exactly. Okay, perfect. I will support the motion because I think it's not doesn't um, it's not bad asking them. It, it I mean it still depends on them. They will decide if they can meet the criteria or not. Um, but I think I'll support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Oh, well, we can ask, uh, and I think Councillor Kelly's right. Uh, you can ask whatever you want to ask. Um, I think what I would suggest is that it probably will not pass at the board level. I'd be surprised if it did. Um, so the question that I have to Mr. Um, Fleming is what means could we use to bring uh, agenda items uh, that are on the EMRB board agenda to council in a more timely manner as opposed to the rigmarole of trying to get them to do that? Because as you know, and I know, um, it takes a lot to put together an agenda and it's not an easy process and, and rushing things another week is not an ins inconsequential amount of work. Um, so is there anything we could do? Because I'm presuming they're going to say no. So, But what can we do to achieve what Councillor Kelly and I think Councillor Lennox and the rest of us, how can we have a more fulsome discussion on regional issues that allow us to identify really what are the core values for us to be able to espouse to the MRB through our representative being the mayor? So that's a long question. Give me a good answer. Uh, through your worship, with the amount of time that we have right now, typically um, we get the agenda a week before the meeting, as has been pointed out. We, we send council everything we get on the EMRB as soon as we get it now. So council has about the maximum amount of time to consider it with, with what we've got that the challenge is council's ability to have a discussion on that, like you referenced before an EMRB meeting. So if you've only got one week's notice and we don't happen to have a council meeting in there, uh, that's a challenge. Um, what can we do um, to have more discussion on it? I think there's not much more we can do with the service level we have right now. It's something that uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Smith and I kind of do as, uh, uh, you know, out of personal interest and off the corner of our desk that we provide council with information and facilitate discussion when we can. Um, and uh, you'd be looking at, you know, do you want to have special council meetings? Um, do you want to have longer council meetings to enable more time like that? I mean, those would be some of the options council consider or putting, as we've discussed before, putting more staffing resources into it. And then you get more comprehensive reports that break down the, uh, the issues involved. So, uh, Thanks, Mr. Fleming. That's kind of what I expected you'd have to say. Um, you know, um, um, if that's the case, then we're going to have to have more frequent meetings and we're going to have to have longer meetings because really we should be considering much broader number of things to ensure that we are individually representing the interests of our community. Um, anybody that is interested can come to those meetings. They're public meetings. And uh, I sit in them as the alternate uh, to the mayor. And I tend, I think there's only one or two that I haven't been able to get to for whatever reason, but uh, we're all entitled to go. And you can you certainly pick up flavor uh, by attending the meeting and staying there and listening to what, what's going on. A lot of it's a lot of rhetoric, but it is what it is. And it is a, a establishing a regional agenda. I mean, we heard about the MRSP today. And, uh, you know, that's the sort of stuff that ultimately um, uh, is important. All of that stuff ends up coming around anyways. So I'm not sure how you could shape it, uh, regardless of whether you knew about it a week in advance or not. So I'm not sure if the utility of what uh, Councillor Kelly is asking is really going to uh, accomplish much. I don't think they'll, they'll approve it in any event, but stranger things have been known to happen. So if it passes, I guess we'll see where it goes. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sperling. Nothing? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd just like to say to the uh, comment, uh, when Council asked for more information uh, with regards to the EMRB, we actually did put it on the agenda. We also put 
an opportunity in the uh, chat to be able to have uh, any of the boards or commissions that are regional provide information. And, uh, you know, I took, I took back our comments to one of the workshops and I indicated that that our council would like more information and to be able to have a communications. And based on that, they actually uh, put out after each task force, they're putting out a communications so that it can be distributed. And that's where um, anything out of those ones, the recommendations from those task forces are the ones that go to the board uh, for consideration. So I think with that, I think there has been some good changes made that there is better communication being provided, not just to our council, but to all councils, all 13 of the councils. So, you know, I think there has been some really good strides put forward and, uh, you know, um, my biggest, my biggest concern with this is if it's with the EMRB, I think it should be with all of our regional boards that we have because the water board, the wastewater board, even Heartland Housing, each one of those have significant regional impact or significant sub-regional impacts to our community. And some of them actually have bigger impacts because I mean, I know Heartland Housing talking about building a new building, um, you know, and there's conversations going on about that. And we haven't heard conversations about that. We've uh, heard very little except at budget time about water rates and and uh, sewer rates, you know. And so I guess I just kind of go, you know, like I have trouble when we just pinpoint one, one board where there are multiple boards that uh, have major impacts or actually potentially larger financial impacts on our communities. So that's just my comments on that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lennox. I think that, um, you know, it's easy, I guess, to deflect from from what we have before us. And I think that it's important to stay focused on, on the motion itself. Um, I don't think that there's any harm in asking um, whether or not it'll go through, um, who knows. But I think that, uh, I think it's an important uh, to at least ask the question on whether or not there can be a little bit more time for us as a group to really just discuss what's going on and have the opportunity to have some of those discussions and and give us a feel for you know the things that are happening not just within our community but within the region. So um, I'll, can, I'll I'll support the motion. Okay, thank you, Councillor Macon, and then I'll go to Councillor Kelly for close. Um, so I guess I'll. I agree with a couple comments. I agree with Councillor Lennox. There's there's no harm in asking and seeing if we can get the information sooner and the EMRB can let us know if that's possible. Um, I also agree that the EMRB isn't the only one with regional impacts and that um, I guess in the spirit of what this is doing, if you sit on a regional committee, then um, we should be sending the agendas out when we have them as well, just in case there are things that we can all be discussing or that have future impacts. So I guess I would just um, hope that the spirit of what's happening today is shared with um, the other regional boards and committees and that we don't necessarily need um, more notice of motions, but if you get your agenda early, then to share it. So those are my comments. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Councillor Kelly to close. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, some good points. I would point out to Council that as of today, we now have a new Council. Maybe it's not today. We now have, though, very recently, a Council and Board policy that, that obliges Councillors to to report on a regular and ongoing basis. That's something new for this council. Uh, I think that if there's some thought amongst my fellow councillors that other that we shouldn't have to have the AMRB report earlier if nobody else has to report earlier is a bit of a red herring. Uh, there's no question the AMRB has bigger and larger impact on an ongoing basis with every community uh, it's just that simple. Uh, I would give a 
the fact that, that, that we didn't get information on, on the activities of the MRB until, until we asked for it, uh, I, I find a bit telling. Uh, I gotta be honest, I, I, the lady that spoke, I think the, the, the chair this afternoon or earlier this up in this meeting in response to, I think, Councillor Lennox's question on, on the growth plan uh, and stated that the growth plan was, was supported by 13 municipalities. When I asked three years ago or two years ago, I should say, two years ago for the council minutes and the documentation to, to show the council support and the discussion that led up to that support, um, there was none, there was no formal meeting. There was no formal meeting to discuss this stuff. And that is, that is multi-generational stuff. So the MRB certainly irrefutably in my mind has a much larger ongoing potential impact to our community. So I'll leave it at that. We'll see, um, we'll see how my fellow councillors think. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. The motion is now closed. Please cast your vote. Was there another whoops, sorry, was there another notice of motion for this evening? Councillor Lennox? Oh, sorry. Councillor Lennox? I do. And it kind of ties in, I guess, with what we were just discussing. Uh, I have a notice of motion that council direct administration to prepare a business case and operating budget request for additional intergovernmental support. And further that this information be included in the 2021 proposed operating budget deliberation package for council's discussion. Okay, and uh, that will be presented at the July 7th? Yes. Meeting? Okay, thank you. Just so that they have the date on that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, any other notice of motions, Councillor Kelly? Yes, thank you. Uh I have a notice of motion for the next council meeting, July 7th, that council direct administration to provide a report on amendments to the land use bylaw that facilitate the redevelopment and repurposing of hotels into adaptive uses prior to December 31, 2020. And that will be presented at the July 7th? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've captured both of those. And those have been presented to administration or alleged services. Just looking for heads. Okay, thank you. Are there any other notice of motions? Not seeing any. Um, are there any points of interest? I can see everybody on the screen. So if you do just put up your hand. Not seeing any. Are there uh, any councillor inquiries? Councillor Harris? I would uh, inquire to the city manager through to the utility manager. Um, there was sewer flushing going on in our neighborhood yesterday. And we came home and there was a large amount of water um, beside the toilet and all around the, the areas around one of our toilets in one of our bathrooms. We have three bathrooms, but it was only in one on the upper floor. And so my question is, is it common for when sewer flushing is being done in a residential area that there can be backup coincidentally um, that causes water to erupt out of a, a toilet? Because it is coincidental that the flushing is going on. It has never happened before. And uh, so I would like a uh, formal report on, uh, on that. And uh, I'd like it by the 7th of uh, of July. I'm just kidding. No, I'm, I I would like to have some response from our administration as to whether it is common that toilets can erupt. Now, fortunately, there was no mess that was bad and we cleaned it up, but I was a little bit askance to come in and find water all over the place. So, and it didn't happen by anything in my house. It happened outside. So that's my question. 
inquiry. Mr. And Fleming, do you have an answer? Just uh, that we'll take that one away and we'll uh, we'll share the response with council. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other uh, councillor inquiries? Not seeing heads nodding. Um, whoops, okay, apparently we still had some uh, one item to cover uh, out of in camera. So with that, I will take a motion to go in camera. Councillor Abatoye. I'll make a motion that council goes in camera. Thank you very much. Uh, the smolter, will that come up on our? Your worship, it should be up very shortly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll accept the motion. Can you cast your vote? Thank you. That is carried unanimously. Thank you. To the moderator, do you need, Andrew, do you need a moment to uh, clear the live or just confirm? Okay, I'm being asked for a five minute uh, recess. So if you can be back in your seats at quarter two, we'll just take a five minute recess. And we'll confirm that we are off. Okay, thank you.